tuberculosis again, I think to myself as I lick the red from my lips. It's always tuberculosis lately. It's like they're trying to antagonize me, test my limits, to see if I'll stay on program, figuratively and literally. They know I hate that taste. It's got a bitter flavor to it, and a grainy texture that borders on unpalatable. But what else am I supposed to do? A girl's gotta eat. If I go back to scrounging for scraps on the streets, the hunters will come after me again, and this time I might not escape with just a scar on my sternum. Thank goodness for newbies and their poor understanding of anatomy. The media makes us out to be these soulless monsters without a trace of humanity, totally separate from our old selves. They're wrong. I'm still me. It's just that I've changed to a diet of death. But I am me. My memories. My feelings. My hopes and dreams. I am enough. I am valid. I am a good person. At least that's what my therapist tells me. It took a while for me to accept that mantra as truth, but here I am. I can say it loudly and proudly. I am enough. I am valid. I am a good person. I thank the doctors and nurses profusely, because even though the meal was a meh on the culinary scale of one to wow, they deserve my respect. They work long and hard at a thankless job, and if I give them even a sliver of positivity in their otherwise cruddy day, I sure will. I exit the hospital through the back doors, checking left and right to make sure I'm in the clear. I leave like a thief in the night, like I've done something wrong. Staff have told me that I don't have to do that, that I can walk out the front door with my head held high. I'm following the program, so there's nothing to be ashamed of. I tell them maybe I will one day, but I know that's a lie. I've always felt a bit dirty after I've eaten. I don't think that's ever going to change. I take off towards my den in a quick stride. I don't do dilly-dallying. Not after I've eaten. Even under the cloak of night, I feel exposed. I worry someone will, I don't know, smell my belly full of blood and mistake me for an undesirable, for a predatory vampire. A scar on my sternum prickles with phantom pains whenever another's gaze meets mine. I try to smile and look as innocent as a lamb. I make sure my ID card is visible, if a little subtle, just in case they're worried. As I turn the corner, I see legs sticking out from behind a dumpster in the alley. In the darkness, there are three pairs of glowing eyes staring me down. They're animalistic, hungry. For a moment, I think they're going to attack me like they did with whoever those legs are attached to, but when I grin a friendly smile and wave, they run away. They likely sensed my kindred humanity, or maybe they're just not used to being smiled to. Who knows? But it costs nothing to smile. So that's what I do. I make it to my den. It's an old basement with windows boarded up so densely not even a crack of sunlight can shine through. But with the proper lamps and strong bulbs, I can almost feel the sun's rays on me. I convinced the landlord to let me repaint the walls, so I've turned each into murals of perfect sunny days. There's a summer picnic at the park, a sunset on the beach, sunrise in the mountains. Little pleasures that make my existence more bearable. I like it bright. It feels safe and normal. I walk into the kitchen and pull a bag of tea from the jar labeled After Live, with the after being hand scrawled by yours truly with a permanent marker, sugar from one labeled Laugh, and finally a bit of cream from the jar labeled Love. I may not be alive, but I can still laugh and love. So those two labels remain untampered with. 
The kettle whistles, and I pour hot water into my cat mug. The handle is shaped like a fluffy tail. It makes me happy, even though it's not very practical. The ears pop up around the rim, and if you're not careful, you could poke yourself in the eyes. I do not have that problem. I never drink my tea. I hold the mug in my hands, I blow on it, and I read motivational blogs. I feel human this way, connected. And with my meal still churning in my stomach, I can almost pretend like it's the tea that's sustaining me. Oh wow, Carol from Van Life Light just announced a new line of facial moisturizer called Girl Balls. Good for her. She deserves it. There's a knock at the door. And at first, I hesitate to answer. It's late, and late night callers are usually trouble, but something about the silence behind the door compels me to open it and see what's out there. It's a man. No, it's a boy. I can smell the youth on him. He's barely 30. Probably got turned less than a decade ago, if that. He has a scowl on his face, and after a moment of shared quiet, I recognize the hungry intensity in his eyes. He was one of the ones in the alleyway earlier. Aren't you going to invite me in? He asks as though my permission is necessary. It would be if I were human, but we both know I'm not. I step aside and gesture to the couch. I sense a hint of judgment from him as he looks at it. Ikea? Really? I shrug. I was on a budget, and I liked the teal shade. It reminded me of the ocean. He steps inside and ignores my offer to sit. Instead, he crosses his arms and stares me down. He's as intimidating as a growling puppy. I can't help but wonder whether he thinks it's going to work on me. I can see him subtly inflating his chest. He's trying to make himself look big and strong, but like I said earlier, as far as vampires go, he's just a kid. I've been around for longer. I'm faster. I can do things it takes decades to master. He waits for me to say something, but I don't. Once the silence has hung for far too long, he finally speaks. You're part of that stupid government program, aren't you? Yes. <laughs> disgusting. I would argue that a snack behind the dumpster is more disgusting, but to each their own. He continues. You should join us. Us, I think. The other set of eyes in the alley. Probably more. There's likely a whole pack of them. This visit, I realize, is a recruitment call. I lift a hand to stop him. I'm not interested. I said sternly, but not unkindly. You'd rather eat handouts? You'd rather be their dog? It's degrading. Degrading, he says. No, degrading is being so hungry you're practically feral. It's feeling the tendrils of starvation crawl up your spine and burrow into your brain, turning all logical thought to jello until all that's left is the need to feed. Degrading is being so hungry you practically tear a child's head clear off, digging into their throat. What I'm doing isn't degrading. It's survival. In any case, if I was to succumb to peer pressure, I would have done so a long time ago. His words are nothing new to me. I'm enough. I'm valid. I am a good person. I recite my mantra in my head until the bad thoughts are gone and only sunshine remains. It's not as bad as it sounds, you know. You get regular meals and their terminal patients get to go peacefully and with dignity. He huffs, his upper lip lifting in a snarl more appropriate for a werewolf than a vampire. They're just using you to cut embalming costs. Join me. The gang and I, we eat the good stuff. Fresh. Nothing sick. Ever. His recruitment tactic could use some work. He comes off like a petulant child, not a night stalker. I almost feel bad for him, glamorizing, sharing a single human between his whole pack and acting like that's somehow better. He suddenly screams, What the fuck is that? 
My gaze follows his eyes. Oh, that's just my Roomba. Are those googly eyes? Yes. He hisses. Ugh, is that a bow? Why does it have a bow? Mr. Jeeves is fancy. I can see the disgust in his eyes growing by the minute. I think he's regretting coming here. But we both know if he came, it's because he's desperate. When you're not on the program, you're at risk. He's easy pickings for hunters. Probably needs a bigger pack for protection. Lookouts, muscle, that kind of thing. He unbristles, but he remains tense. He takes a few steps away from Mr. Jeeves. I can see him glancing at him from the corner of his eyes every so often. Is he afraid of it? Look, we've got a good group going. We don't need any handouts from the government. We can feed ourselves. You should join us. I scratch the back of my head and look over at him again. What about hunters? It's obvious he's never had a close call in his afterlife. But that won't last. Not if he keeps leaving bodies around town. He considers his words and then says, We're careful. We get them before they get us. Ah, youthful bravado. Mr. Jeeves continues its rounds through the living room, and the recruiter watches it nervously, dodging it whenever it comes near. I'm sorry, but I'm not leaving the program to join a bunch of young whippersnappers. I've had too many close calls. I'm not looking for trouble. <sighs> Vamps like you disgust me. He hisses angrily as he stomps to the door. I'll be back in a week. Think about it. Give me an answer then and only then. Just as he's about to walk out the door, Mr. Jeeves rolls past him and he jumps out and lets a startled yelp before leaving the scene. <laughs> so he was afraid of it after all. I go back to my sofa and hold up my cup of tea. It's lukewarm now. The program is fine, I remind myself. It's not like the blood is terrible. It tastes like leftover hamburgers. It's never going to be as good as filet mignon. I know that, but it still does the trick. I put my visitor out of my mind. I've been fed. Everything's fine. I can do this. I am enough. I am valid. I am a good person. A few days pass without a call from the hospital. It's fine. I've gone longer without a meal. But on the third day, I'm eager for the phone to ring. Thankfully, it does, and I head over, keeping to the alleyways in the familiar back door. It's tuberculosis again. I don't need to taste it to know. She's coughing up a lung, and I know she's not long for the world. She specifically asked for this. It's a kindness. When we feed, the victim feels a certain amount of peace and euphoria in their final moments. It's the most humane form of euthanasia. She doesn't open her eyes, but I greet her all the same. The doctor shows me her consent form, signed and ready. I stamp my thumbprint on the bottom of the form, and he scans my ID card to confirm the details. I think it's funny that we do this dog and pony show every time. I'm in here all the time. As I lean over the patient's body, I hear his voice in my head. It's degrading. The contempt in his tone yucks my yum a bit. I try not to let it. I want to be clear, it's not him. He didn't get the better of me. I don't care about peer pressure. It's the weeks of nothing but these damn tuberculosis patients. He's not the one who swayed me one way or another. He's one of dozens who've recited the same spiel. A new pack crops up every few decades, looking for new members. But as I stand over my meal, I can almost taste the bitter taste and grimy feeling of tuberculosis. I should sink my fangs in her. I know I should. Meanwhile, the doctor stands nearby, waiting to pronounce her dead. I'm overwhelmed by the sound of blood rushing through his veins. He smells so 
gosh darn tootin' fresh. A ribeye. No, a wagyu. He doesn't see it coming. We've been working together for most of his career, a drop in the bucket of my afterlife. There's shock on his face as I lunge for him, and I know that shock soon turns to panic as I begin to drain him. He struggles against my grasp, bucking like a bull in all directions. He's putting all his might into his attempted escape, which only makes me restrain him tighter. And then the euphoria sets in, and his panic subsides. He goes limp in my arms, and it feels like I'm alive for the first time in forever. His leg gives a final kick. I don't know if it's conscious. If he has enough presence of mind to see through the fog or the bite and try one last pathetic attempt at saving himself. It's too late either way. We're past the point of no return. Both of us. His blood is divine. It's fragrant. It's like digging your teeth into a chocolate cake or a still warm loaf of bread. I can help but let out a moan, even though I know that's not very ladylike of me. It flows through me with the thrill of a racer speeding down the track. The doctor falls to the floor with a thud, now pale and gaunt. I remain in place, licking every last droplet of blood from my lips. I'm brought back to reality by a pathetic little grunt coming from the tuberculosis patient. I feel like I'm having an out-of-body experience. It somehow feels like I both did and did not kill the doctor. But his blood's in my mouth. Some of his hair and skin in my hands and under my nails. I've messed up. I run. I hope no one sees me. The front doors are closer, and for once in my afterlife I head towards them rather than the back. Just as I'm about to reach them, I hear the alarms go off and I'm suddenly very aware that my running immediately flags me as the culprit. I try to slow down so I don't look so suspicious, so I can slip out unnoticed, but the doctor's blood has me giddy and the fear moves my legs as though their own. It's her! I recognize the voice as being one of the nurses. Stephen? No. Stephanie? Something like that. I'm vaguely aware of the sound of a crossbow being strung behind me. The doors are so close, if I can just... The crossbow fires. Right through my chest from the back. The pain is searing hot, like my molecules are being torn apart. Of course, the hospital staff would understand basic anatomy. Of course, they know where the heart is. As I feel myself leaking into dust, I recite my mantra one last time. I was enough. I was valid. And because I don't feel a lick of remorse for what I'd done, maybe I wasn't such a good person after all. They called it collective meditation. A video chat meditation and wellness course for people who don't leave their house much or didn't have access to those kinds of classes locally. It was free, and I was bored, so I signed up for it and convinced my best friend Benny to do it with me. The first time was kind of weird. Not because I'd never tried meditation before, but the whole awkward weirdness of doing it in a formalized setting with other people was only made stranger when you were seeing each other over the internet instead of being in the same room. Benny was even more nervous than I was, asking me if it was optional to turn on his camera or if there was maybe a video we could watch instead. I told him no, that this class had very specific requirements. You had to be single and live by yourself, be between the ages of 20 and 50, and you have to show up virtually with sound and video at every session or you were out of this class. We were actually on video chat then, too. His house was 30 miles away, and it wasn't uncommon that we'd chat sometime during the week. When I started telling him all the rules, I could feel him overreacting before his eyes grew large. Shit, what kind of requirements are those? You have to be single and live alone? Are they going to come home invade us while we're meditating? I could hear his laughter in his voice, but he seemed nervous. Rolling my eyes, I shook my head at him. <laughs> no, it's... Nothing like that. They explain when you sign up that this course is funded by a research grant. They're trying to test different techniques of long-distance meditation together. They call it 
collective meditation. And to get reliable results, they're trying to control certain variables. I think it's just some of those. When he looked unconvinced, I gave him a small shrug. Besides, if we don't like it, we don't have to keep doing it. I was actually less sure about it after the first session. Not because of feeling awkward, but because nothing much happened. There were 20 of us in the group, and the leader, a woman that just referred to herself as Amy, had all of us go around and tell about ourselves. After that, we spent half an hour with our eyes closed, with the repeated instructions to think about yourselves, your complete selves, down to the smallest detail, the smallest molecule. Think about the cells of your hair, the color of your eyes and eyelashes, the smell and texture of your skin. Think about how your hands and face look, how your body looks to you. Let your mind be an invisible camera, capable of amazing precision roaming over every inch of you. And then, you move inside now. Imagine the wet interior darkness of your body as you see your muscles and fat, tendons and organs, veins and blood and electricity. See all of that throughout your body as you would imagine they are, and then push past that, moving deeper Deeper until your eyes adjust to that inner dark where your mind and your heart and your soul reside. Move close to them and take them in with your truest sight. When that was finally over, I looked over at the laptop's clock and saw that over an hour had passed. I was surprised, but I guessed it made some kind of sense. I felt off balance and odd, like I'd just woken suddenly from a deep sleep. When we got the call with the promise to be back for the Friday session, I was already preparing my casual agreement with Benny that this wasn't for us. That was pretty awesome. We were just on the phone now, but I still had to hide the surprise in my voice. Oh, you really liked it? I could tell the excitement in his voice was genuine. Yeah, didn't you? I mean, it felt really cheesy at first, but I don't know. The longer we did it, the more I felt connected to myself, and this sounds dumb, but more at peace, like I was a part of something bigger, too. When I didn't respond right away, he spoke up again, his voice slightly concerned. You did like it, right? Oh, <laughs> sure, yeah, it, it was cool. I kind of expected Benny to still forget or flake on the Friday session by then, but he texted me twice that morning to make sure I remembered to get on. This time it was still weird, but we spent our session with the other members pairing off for five minutes at the time, talking to another member, being encouraged to be mindful of how they looked and sounded and how speaking with them made us feel. It was very uncomfortable at first, but by the end of the session I felt like I'd made new friends and even in that brief time, I felt like I'd gotten to know them better than some people I'd known for years. Over the next two months, our numbers dwindled to 16, but out of that 16, everyone had become very close. We were taught to see ourselves as connected and to learn how to see and feel things from each other's point of view. As we progressed, we started doing more actual meditation too, both singly, in pairs, and part of the larger group. I'm not sure when things changed, but they did. A passing from one atmosphere to another, from air to water, or... No, not water, maybe... Amniotic fluid. A world where you can breathe and everything is tied to every other thing. I thought about the group every day, and even with our increased sessions to four times a week, I think the off days would have been unbearable if I hadn't had a dim sense of them out there. All of us tied to one another as we worked and slept and waited for the next session. As for the sessions themselves, they were becoming something different as well. Amy had started preparing us for shared spaces. The idea that by all meditating on the same places or experiences simultaneously, we could exist in the same spiritual and psychic space together. A few weeks before, I would have laughed at the idea, but I wasn't laughing now. Each session filled me with this terrible, wonderful excitement. The things I would see had started taking our reality and texture the closer we got to that shared space. I could smell colors and taste the emotions of others in our group. 
I had the prescient sense of the light just around the bend, the wonder just beyond this inner space that had tracked me for so long. Just another session or two and we... Do you realize we haven't hung out in almost a month? Benny had called me out of the blue as we were leaving a session, and while I was frustrated to have my warm feeling of joy interrupted by the phone, I figured he just wanted to talk about how great the course was going. So when he started out with that question, I didn't really know what to say. Uh, huh? No, that can't be right. He sounded like he was chewing something. I hated when he chewed when he talked. No, it is. We were going to go eat lunch a couple of weeks ago, but I got food poisoning the night before. And then last week, I was going to come over for movie night, but you bailed on me in the last minute. <laughs> I did not. I just realized I needed more time to work on my actualization technique before the session the next day. Actualization techniques were what Amy called her methods of imagining a whole reality outside the physical world or your own mind and imagination. One of these shared spaces that we can all picture and believe in so powerfully and completely that our belief could make it real. It was important work. And if Benny didn't realize that, then... Uh, and that's another thing. The coursework is great and all. I mean, it's weird and kind of new agey, sure, but I do see the benefits. We're part of something special. The group is something special. Sure, yeah. And I'm not saying we're in a cult or something, but I do feel like whatever we're gaining in our connection to the group, maybe we're losing that between you and me. I opened my mouth to respond, but then thought better of it. Maybe he was right. I felt angry and defensive that he was questioning what we were a part of, but was that a good thing? Should I be so committed to something and not be willing to look at it objectively? I felt a twist of nervous fear in my stomach. But I couldn't lose it. Not now. Especially not now, when we were so close to the next stage. Hand trembling slightly against my cheek, I tried to keep my voice light. I see. Um, I see what you mean. I tell you what. Let's get through this week's sessions, and if Amy doesn't have us into something new and cool by the end of that, maybe we take a break. How does that sound? Benny paused for a while, and I could feel him pondering it, wrestling with his emotions as he weighed his options. It was funny, because in some ways I knew him so much better now, I could almost know what he was thinking before he said it. But in other ways, well, in other ways he'd become a stranger to me. So when I felt his fear and doubt and love for me coiled together, writhing like snakes in his chest, my empathy was profound, but I only felt the slightest stir of compassion. When he finally agreed to continue, I primarily felt relief. Sixteen was a good number for the group, after all. We visited our shared space together for the first time that Sunday night. I don't have the words to really describe how meaningful it was, being in that place that we all knew and loved so well that we had breathed into life with Amy's guidance. It was a sense of ownership and belonging that I'd never known in my physical life. And I know what you're probably thinking. We're all just imagining the same place, or think we are, and we're tricking ourselves into thinking there's something more going on. Because it's absurd to believe that we can create real places with our minds, or that we can truly connect with people we've never met. Touch them when they're on the other side of the country or world. All I can say is that your lack of belief is immaterial. The paucity of your vision doesn't change anything. The hands in the deepest deep don't require your faith to grasp at them, and the eyes in the highest heavens see you even if you cannot fathom them. Amy taught us those words, and at first I didn't understand them. They seemed haughty and strange and silly. Then she led us into her shared space that Sunday, and I began to weep. We were all there, together. I could see and feel and touch and taste, and I was with my group, more than just friends or family. We were part of each other in a more profound way than just emotion or thought. And we were all weeping, all laughing and screaming in joy and excitement as we walked arm in arm across fields of sunflowers. 
It was on our fourth trip to the field, the following week that we first saw the other. Rosalind saw it first, and when she felt fear, we all felt fear. We all turned toward the source of the ripple, the disturbance of our tranquility, the invader in our sacred space. It looked like a man, but it was not. You need to understand that in our refined and shared experience, we'd come to perceive things differently, especially when we were in meditation, and most certainly when we were in this place. Benny had joked that being in the field must be what it feels like to be God, and while he was laughing when he said it, there was a jagged, fearful shakiness to it that I felt trembling all the way to his core like the jumping strands of a spider web. He wasn't wrong, though. We saw more together, and in this place, and looking into that thing, it looked like nothing. Not darkness or the lack of something, but like a hungry abyss, an absence, an abscess, an appetite. An appetite with flashing eyes and gnashing teeth set into a rotting hole in our beautiful world that had legs and hands and a terrible laugh as it began to run toward us all. That's when we began to scream. We'd become so lost in that world over time that our first fear response was to run away rather than pull ourselves free. It was only after Beverly was run down that Benny started yelling for us to step back, step back, which was our words for pulling ourselves away from each other and our shared dream. It didn't work. That was impossible. We could always leave when and where we wanted. We were the masters here, after all, and at the end of the day, however real this place felt, if we're honest, our bodies are still back in... Another was pulled down into the sunflowers. Tony, I think. He gave a muffled yell, and then the thing was on him. Tears of anger and fear screaming down my face. I turned away and kept running, forcing myself to focus. Just step away, step away, step away. Two more, then another three. The field went on without end, and it was just picking us off one at a time. Another hundred yards of running and crying and trying to step back and finding myself still trapped in the field. Another six were gone. That should leave four more, including myself and Amy. Always the odd woman out, always the leader and anchor of the group, but outside its number. But I hadn't seen Amy since we started running. It was possible that the thing had gotten her, but I hadn't felt her fear and pain and terror in the way I had the others as they'd gone down. I couldn't feel her at all. I let out a gasp as it got to Benny. Even after everything, the pain of losing him was worse than the others after all. I had to keep running. I had to. No. I needed to stop. Running wasn't going to work. I needed to stop, close my eyes, and force myself to really step back. My breath was ragged as I slowed to a stop. I shouldn't even really be breathing in that place if I didn't want, but that didn't stop my sides from aching as I wrapped shaking hands around myself and forced my eyes to close as I focused on stepping back. Behind me, I could feel it getting closer. I could feel the terror that Aaron felt as it reached out for her. I had to hurry. I had to hurry before it get to me. I had to step back. I opened my eyes. I was still in the field of sunflowers, and the thing that was standing before me now staring down at me as I began to scream. I went to run again, but it shoved me roughly onto the ground, laughing as it climbed on top of me, its impossible lack of form heavy and cold and ever-shifting as it straddled me and sank what must be its face close to mine. I went to beg it, to tell it I would do whatever it wanted if it could just please go when its head shot forward, something hard and rancid pressing against my lips as an icy tongue shoved its way into my mouth and snaked down my throat. For a moment I failed and gagged, knowing that I was about to die. The mantra of survival drumming in my mind and heart and soul as I felt my core begin to tear free from whatever moorings they had left. I'll do anything. 
anything, anything. I know you will. The answer ripped through me, even as the thing on top of me and the ground beneath me disappeared. I was back in my living room, laying on the floor in a rancid puddle of my own piss and shit, my coffee table and lamp broken from where I'd flailed around as my body prepared to die. When I was able, I started to crawl. That was all months ago. I knew that most of the others had come back too. What had seemed like the thing killing them had been... Well, I don't know what it was, but I could feel them alive out there, even Benny. Only Amy and Beverly seemed untraceable if I closed my eyes and reached out. It may seem strange that we didn't talk or check on each other, but we all knew what we all knew. And even then, we knew that something was wrong. That something was wrong and had found us and joined us unless they had been a part of our group all along. I still wondered about Amy, after all, and what her role in all this had really been. For a long time, we maintained our distance from each other, and every time I thought about reaching out to someone, another person would disappear. It was like seeing a light disappear on a distant shore. My group was winking out one by one, and if we didn't do something soon, the dark would consume us all, for as we all knew, everything was connected. So it was that day I picked up the phone to call Benny. At that very moment, he knocked at my door. I should have known something was wrong before I opened it. But I was frazzled and stretched thin by worry and fear, and I could still sense Benny on the other side of the door when I threw down my phone and ran to it. That familiar comfort was so powerful that I had already hugged him and invited him in before I realized my mistake. When he shut the door, I never considered trying to make a run for it. Benny was already bigger and stronger than I was. And whatever was living in him now, I couldn't sense what it was exactly, but I could feel it there in him, peering out at me like a hungry owl. He laughed as he took my arm and guided me into the living room. Sitting me down gently on the sofa, he sat in an opposite chair. It took me to this point to realize how he was dressed. A dark gray suit, sharply pressed, with a silver tie pin and black cufflinks that glittered when he moved, Benny's long-fingered hands. Bile running up my throat, I gasped out a question. What are you? The thing that looked like Benny smiled at me warmly. If I could feel... Some of what this is, if I couldn't hear echoes of the real Benny, still trapped in there, terrified, I might have been fooled into thinking it was actually being friendly. When it spoke, however, the coldness of its tone would have broken any such spell. Some call me Trogon, it chuckled. Hmm. Others call me the elegant Trogon. He leaned toward me with Benny's face. Do you know what that means? I started to shake my head and stop myself. I suddenly had a memory of the summer I spent with my grandmother as a child. She lived in Arizona and we'd spent several hot afternoons bird watching, which amounted to me looking through an old bird book while she drove around sipping gin. But something. The elegant Trogon's a bird, isn't it? Benny's face lit up the corners of his mouth jerking up into a broader grin that might even seem natural if you don't know him. That's exactly right. A funny little bird. Ornithologists call them secondary cavity nesters. He drew down his face into a mock look of dismay. Sounds fairly uneasy, but what it really means is that he likes to live in holes made by others. He pursed his lips. I can appreciate that. Look, I... Please, just... His eyes grew hard. Don't interrupt. I'm trying to teach you something. When it was satisfied with my shaking silence, it continued. The thing is, I'm no bird. Not an elegant trogon. Not even a lark. His mouth twisted momentarily as though he'd tasted something sour. 
I need a much bigger place to live, for one thing. And for another, I... Well, I stay so hungry. The thing gave a small sigh. No. The first name, just plain old Trogon. That fits me much better, I'm afraid. It's what the Greeks used to call me. The Trogon. The Gnar. Why? Why are you telling me all this? His expression darkened. Because I'm already halfway through your little group. Because unless you want to feel my teeth from the inside in the next few months, I'd suggest you do like your little friend Amy did and recruit more people to join the party. You know, create a buffer. I forced myself to meet his eyes. What happened to Amy? He gave me a wide, gleaming shark of a smile. She's retired comfortably to Florida, of course. He paused, waggling Benny's eyebrow at me. Or I ate her anyway. How does either scenario impact the necessity for you to find more people if you don't want to become my little nesting hole down the line? I gave a trembling shrug. I, I, I guess it doesn't. No, it doesn't. With that, he stood and headed to the door. I was desperate for him to get out, but I was also just desperate. Asking him to wait, I stopped just short of calling him Benny, the name lodging in my throat as I felt my friend screaming for me from some inner chamber in that thing. When he turned back, his expression was cold, but curious. Yes? How? How do, how, how do I get people to make... Uh, a space for you. Like Amy did. It wrinkled Benny's nose like it smelled something bad. Yeah. I always thought that whole meditation, social media, whatever, was kind of lame. Who wants that nowadays? People want fucking and death. They want to be entertained. And so long as they think about me, for some of them, it'll create a connection. A little hole... I can start to burrow when the time is right. But what does that look like? I was terrified of making it angry, but I might not have another chance to ask what to do. What should I try? Grimacing, he shrugged. I don't know. Be creative. Use your impending doom as motivation if you'd like. Or don't, and I'll just eat you and find someone who's smarter. It started to turn away again when it stopped, raising a finger as though testing the wind or declaring a discovery. Looking over its shoulder, it gave me a gleeful leer. I know what you can do. I felt the deepest part of me shriveling under that gaze. What? He snickered and opened the front door, calling back to me as he went out into the night. Tell a story. When Joey was first brought to me, I didn't really understand what his parents and doctor wanted. At the time, I worked at a small startup that was experimenting with new techniques in MEG, which is a sort of real-time MRI that allows medical technicians to scan a patient's ongoing brain patterns. More specifically, for the previous two years, my company has been working on visual reconstruction. Our algorithms could build a black and white image of what a subject was processing in their visual cortex. In short, if you imagined a sight, we could see it with you. I immediately disliked Mrs. Campbell. I had already gotten several pushy emails from her, so by the time she and Joey showed up in my office unannounced, I would already knew exactly who I was talking to. Her power suit, uptight sitting position, and severe expression only added to her edge. Look, I've already had this conversation 87 times before. She stated, eyeing me as I moved to sit behind my desk. You'll go on about how this isn't your specialty, or Joey's case isn't appropriate for the technology, or a dozen other excuses. I get it. It's not in your job description. Lifting a hand sheepishly at having been so expertly called out, I went to speak, but she cut me off. I'll have you know that I 
literally learned neuroscience to better pursue the truth of my son's condition. Every other doctor in the tri-state area has come up short. This is my lead. I know enough to make an educated guess. Your technology will uncover something about Joey's problem. She let silence hang over my office. Next to her, Joey sat with his face buried in a thick book. He was a small and gangly, as I expected an ill six-year-old boy to be, but Descartes' discourse on the method seemed to be a bit out of his range. My immediate suspicion was that the mother herself might be driving some of her son's endless night terrors. I considered her words for a moment before asking, You learned neuroscience. She was not amused. Yes. Are you a doctor? No. Then where did you find the time? The slightest hint of a proud smile curled up the side of her lip. I'm extremely motivated. There was no arguing that. Since we did need a younger test subject to round out the results, something I'm sure she was aware of, I begrudgingly acquiesced and hurried her out of my office so that I could speak to her son alone. You reading Descartes? That's pretty heavy stuff for a boy your age. He looked up with sharp, bespectacled eyes, surrounded by halos of exhaustion. There's so little time. Subtly put off by his odd answer and perceptive gaze, I shrugged away my apprehension. Alright then, let's begin. I led him to the next room and explained that our process would require ongoing meetings and tests, since every brain and all the patterns within were unique to each person. The biofeedback mechanisms and tests would take time to adapt algorithms. Never mind, he was reading his book again. <laughs> I couldn't help but smile. At his age, I had escaped into books the same way. His overbearing mother likely didn't help his desire to be present in the moment either. The first tests were simple enough. I hooked him to a less intensive helmet-only version of our machine and had him run through our anchoring images. A tree, a kite, a basketball, and a variety of other pictures with basic shapes and strong recognition quotients. The written portion and medical history had already been submitted by his mother. Done for the day, I walked him out. Our computers will process our recordings of your brain for a few days, and then we'll be able to do more next week. He hesitated before going back into the lobby. You're not like the other doctors. I smiled. <laughs> I'm not? No. You're actually here. Uh, interesting praise. Medical professionals were certainly encouraged to develop emotional distance, but I was not that kind of doctor. Thanks, Joey. He grinned and nodded hard enough for his hair to flop and then ran out into the lobby, his book still clutched in his hands. At one appointment a week, it took about three months to truly narrow in on an accurate brain map. The interesting thing about working with such a young subject was that his brain was more malleable and changing far more rapidly than any of our adult subjects. Other technicians sometimes worked with him, but I made sure to stick with his case and keep an eye on him. As we talked about philosophy, life, and his favorite superheroes among the Avengers, it began to hit home that this bookish little boy slept less than two hours a night. Racks with night terrors as he was, every week we wasted was another week of torture he didn't deserve. I was more than happy to move forward with looser confidence intervals than normal in our data. His brain was constantly changing anyway, I argued, not telling them my real reason for wanting to begin our investigation early. I was actually excited that first night we slid him into the two of the machine for a real imaging run, and I think that excitement transferred to his attitude. There was no more guesswork, 
pills or therapy. After a never-ending series of failures and a lifetime of suffering a medical mystery that had defied all regimens and treatments, we were finally going to witness his night terrors directly. We would stand with him against his fears and see what he was seeing. He put down his book completely for the first time since I'd known him and slid into that imaging tube with a worried but hopeful expression. Thanks to all the prep work and our years of computer medical research already implemented, it was now as simple as watching the video feed as our mainframe began, deciphering the ongoing changes in the magnetic fields of the neurons in his visual cortex. As the fuzzy black and white image grew more coherent, the feed took on the appearance of someone filming from inside of a sheer white tube. Joey, can you hear me? I asked. Yeah. I'm going to flash some simple indicators along the tube above you, alright? I won't be scared. Alright, here we go. The technicians and I watched the videos as the program patterns appeared as darker squares on the inside of the tube. At about a five second delay for processing, the tremendous quantity of three-dimensional neural data in the machine was reading every millisecond. It looks good. Now, here comes the hard part, Joey. What do I do? Now you have to sleep. Are you tired? I can sleep anywhere, even here, he breathed. You want to know my secret? I looked in through the test chamber window at his feet, wondering. <laughs> sure, what? He said triumphantly. I'm always tired. technicians and I shared an awkward laugh, and then we went about the business of waiting. We fell asleep rather quickly, and random scattered images filled our feed, but the real data would only come once he'd begun dreaming. I was reading a magazine when the first coherent images began to flicker to light. There was a slow moment of strange tension that all the men and women in the control room shared as the curious fuzzy blurs began as something privately recognizable and then sharpened into something unknown. What the hell had that been? For a second it felt as if I'd... Well, I can't even say for sure now. But the feed now showed a murky, grayscale scene full of indeterminate fog and little wriggling black things. What are those? Someone asked as we all peered intently at the screen. Someone else wondered aloud. Is this even a dream? Looks like a view from a camera on the weather tower somewhere. It was a pertinent question. There was none of this mise-en-scene we had observed in other subjects' dreams. Here there were no identifiable landmarks, no shifting locations, and apparently no sense of self. Joey's dream was simply his own point of view floating somewhere foggy while scattered, unidentifiable bits of black motion moved about in strangely disgusting manners. I thought they were birds at first, purely by context, but my senses began linking the sight to that of a petri dish. Little black blobs wriggling in a foggy petri dish sky. What the hell were we seeing here? And more importantly, why was this source of so much stress for Joey that it always woke him up? Talking quietly in the control room, we each agreed that dreams like that would be rather peaceful if that was all that happened. Of course, that was not all that happened. Mrs. Campbell herself was out in the waiting room dozing, and I requested she come to my office immediately on threat of arrest. Our security guard and two technicians stood as witness while I turned my laptop around and showed her our recording. This is Joey's dream, I told her, barely covering my anger and disgust at what the video had apparently turned out to be. This is what wakes him up screaming multiple times at night, every night, Mrs. Kim. I hate to ask you this. But do you submerge your son underwater in a vat of leeches? That's ridiculous, 
She spat, furious. I'll get my lawyer immediately if you're going to accuse me of child abuse. I didn't work this hard his entire life to cause the problem myself, you son of a bitch. The guard coughed, and she sat back down and uncurled her fist. As unpleasant as it was, I had to probe deeper. Have you ever heard of Munchausen by proxy syndrome? She took a long breath in through her nose, and then said flatly, That is not what this is. We all watched in silence for a few heartbeats as the horrible end of Joey's dream played out on screen. One of the distant, wriggling black blobs shot forward, growing quickly into massive, swimming, annelid worm that had opened a horrible mouth ringed with teeth and attempted to swallow the point of view itself. The video cut back to his normal eyesight inside the tube just before, due to Joey himself waking up screaming in panic. Mrs. Campbell stared with a moment of true vulnerable fear before quickly donning her mask of confidence again. That's what he dreams about. She sat a little taller. Then we've made progress. It's heartening to finally see what's going on in his head. As for your accusation, you don't look at his files closely enough. He's been having trouble sleeping since the day he was born. There is literally no way I could have caused this in him, especially in those first few days. I wasn't even allowed to hold him because he was so weak due to an inability to sleep well. I shook my head. I saw that in the files, but I know the records have been faked. The human brain restructures itself around age two or three and erases everything that came before. I seriously doubt it's all possible this nightmare has reoccurred since before that time, let alone as far back as the first day of its birth. That would imply some sort of chemical or neurological poisoning. Noticing a certain subtle droop in his mother's shoulders, I turned one of the technicians with a horrible suspicion. Do we have... Mrs. Campbell's medical records? We did. As part of a legal footnote for putting Joey in the program. I leafed through to six years ago, and there it was. You were on nootropics before and during your pregnancy. Cognitive enhancers. Untested on pregnant women and children. I studied her defiant expression. I bet you're still on them. You just learned neuroscience in your free time, did you? She finally spoke with vehemence. I am a single mother, you asshole. Have you tried monophenil yourself? It was the only way I could work hundred hour work weeks between my job and raising Joey and coping with his illness. One of the technicians spoke up with a sour face. But you were on them before you even had him. That's enough, I said, raising a hand. All anger had drained from me, finding out that this was not intentional. It wouldn't help Joey to call the authorities into this. Now, we know another piece of the puzzle. Miss Campbell, I apologize for it, inappropriately putting you on the spot, but I hope you see we've learned something from it. She shoved away from our guard, but scaled down her aggressive stance. Next week... Same time? How about tomorrow night? I couldn't stomach putting him through another week of waiting. The other technicians agreed to work overtime and we came in on Saturday. Joey came in with Victor Frank's man's search of meaning under his arm and I asked him, You're really into the philosophy, aren't you? Again he said, There's so little time. He added more to the second answer because we were closer. Now that it knows about us. I frowned. What do you mean by that? He seemed confused by my question, but I didn't want to push him any further. He was, after all, still a permanently exhausted six-year-old boy. We set him up in the machine and proceeded to wait for his dreams to begin. Now that we knew the cause of all this was likely some sort of neurological poisoning during pregnancy, we spent the entire wait speculating and arguing, hammering out ideas. 
we came to the educated guess that some sort of traumatic memory had been permanently ingrained in his neural makeup thanks to the cognitive enhancing drug that had riddled his body throughout gestation. The womb, one of our female technicians shouted in the manner of a eureka. That's the cause of the fixed murky perspective. He's literally remembering being in the womb. I bet if we tried out colorization technology, we'd find that that murkiness is red. As his dream began again with that same perspective in that foggy void, we added our new colorization algorithms and the video sharpened. Now we could see that he was floating in some sort of nebulous red environment, which would have been expected from the dim light penetrating Mrs. Campbell's skin from outside. So our theory was coming together. But the obvious question had to be asked. Why the leeches? We threw out a couple of ideas, but our resident neuropsychologist could only guess. Maybe they're an addition or a change due to later fears. Perhaps leeches he saw on television. The original form of this memory is impossible to know for sure. Something scared him horribly when he was very young, and this is what remains to torture him. He hesitated. Maybe this happens to all babies, and we just forget it because of the reconstructing of the young brain two years in. They were good theories, but I was still worried about Joey himself. So, how do we fix it? Honestly? Maybe electroshock therapy. What? No. Come on. Someone else threw in a radical idea. Maybe show him the video and ask him what he thinks it is? I looked up and jumped back just as a giant leech-like creature swallowed the screen and Joey woke up screaming. Seeing the whole video as real might scare him even more, but it was worth a shot. With Mrs. Campbell and the other two technicians who Joey trusted in attendance, we sat him in a private room the next day, a Sunday. He laid his book carefully on the table and watched the video on my laptop with a pale face. That's it. That's my dream. His mother held his hand, but he didn't panic like his record said he had before in hypnotherapy and dream therapy sessions. It's real. He began breathing harder, but he seemed to retain control. I don't want to talk about it. They tried to make me talk about it before. I couldn't. I couldn't describe it. I knew that from his records, and I'd already had the idea to handle it. They asked you to describe it before, because they couldn't see it. Are you able to talk around it now that we can see it for ourselves? He fought back tears. I'll try. Alright, Joey. Do you have a sense of when this was? Just nod for yes or shake your head for no. He nodded. Good. Was it a long time ago? He nodded. And you were smaller than you are now. He nodded emphatically. Did something scare you at that time? He nodded weakly, his features draining to white. I don't like thinking about them. Almost as if to protect himself, he took his book and held it to his chest. Them? I pointed to the unmoving black blobs in the paused video. You mean these guys? Yeah. I looked to the others for confirmation before continuing with our plan now that the questions would get riskier. Are you aware that creatures like this really exist? And they're harmless? That got him paying attention. Really? I can show you some scientific information on them if you want to see. They're not nightmares. They're real tiny little things that can't harm you. Lowering his philosophy book to his lap, he took the new text I'd offered him and looked at the article for leeches. He began to smile and even laughed. Is this for real? They're that small? He looked at his hand and compared it to the life-size millimeters long picture of a worm. I must be huge now. 
I had no idea because there's no way to tell then and now. His mother rubbed his arm, not daring to hope. So you're not afraid of them anymore? He shook his head, flopping his hair about. No way! I'm going to sleep right now and stomp that stupid leech if he tries to eat me this time. I'm the one in charge, right? Yeah, I said, smiling uncontrollably. I looked to his mother. Let's get him to the chamber and see how he does. She nodded happily. I couldn't imagine what she was going through. Finally seeing some understanding and progress for her son's torment. We let her sit with him this time, hand on his ankle while he laid inside the machine. He was excited, but sleep came easily thanks to his permanent exhaustion. And we all waited expectantly for his dream to begin. This time, he finally had a sense of self, and we watched as imagined hands pattered out before his sight to move him along through the crimson liquid environment. Now that we had some parallax, we began getting a sense of his environment, and it turned out to be a vast flowing tube rather than the small space we'd expected. The leech-like creatures still wriggled in the distance, but he eluded them by swimming away from his initial location, moving with the current, and he began passing floating little dots of flaring light colored red by the thick unknown liquid, and these, too, moved with the flow. Someone else was the first to ask, What the hell are we seeing? As the tube opened up into a mammoth pulsing cavern whose walls were fleshy and striated, I think it slowly began to dawn on all of us that our theory had been both horribly wrong and horribly right. This was a memory from a time many years before when Joey had been much smaller, but he had not had these experiences during pregnancy. I began to understand when we saw the first flaring point of floating light suddenly flash and form into the fading silhouette of an infant human before vanishing into a strange blur. This... <laughs> it wasn't possible. This wasn't a gestation memory. Joey had been brought into existence, filled with memory enhancers, and the great barrier of brain restructuring that made all human babies forget had failed to work on him. This was pre-life. We stared in horrified awe as he swam through tube after tube, slowly revealing to us the nature of pre-life. He was alive. The tubes were arteries in the chamber's strange hearts. Leech-like creatures ate the flares, and weird octopus-like entities ate the leeches, and strange propelled mouths ate them in turn, all winding a web of eating upon eating that seemed to host thousands of different types of organisms in every artery. Existence before birth was maddeningly full of life in every respect, so much so that bits of that desperate moving and writhing energy gathered into flaring points and became sentient in our own form of reality. Were these souls? Or were these simply the perspective I, which rode around in each of our minds, looking out from our eyes and hearing through our ears to experience the physical world and wonder at the meaning of it all? His philosophy books. What if... No. Wake him up. The others refused, and I backed away from the feed. They hadn't pieced together the grander horror out there known only to this boy. He was a living soul in the truest and most profound sense. Joey knew the pre-life form of existence so implicitly that he never bothered to confirm with other people that they didn't know. As he'd spent every waking moment of his life reading philosophy books because there's so little time now that it knows about us. I'm not ashamed to admit that I panicked. You might even call it a breakdown. I just happen to know what it is now. An unknowable entity so tremendous that it is a form of existence unto itself, filled with energetic life to the point of bursting spontaneously into our very souls themselves. And I shudder for the future. I'm not afraid of it destroying us, no. Against a creature so cosmic, we would never see it coming. And never suffer a millisecond. I'm not even convinced that dealing death is something such a beast of life is capable of. No, I'm afraid of that other fate. 
the path where it has become aware of our child's souls, escaping into another mode of existence through birth, the path where it puts a stop to that leak of its vitality. Women will still get pregnant, and babies will still be born, because those are physical animal processes, but without a spark from pre-life existence. People will still get pregnant, and babies will still be born, because those are physical animal processes, but without a spark from pre-life existence, what will be riding around in their heads? What will see the world? What will wonder at the meaning of it all? I shudder because I know, as a scientist, that vacuums of all sorts tend to be filled. Something will possess our babies and become their souls. It just won't be us. By Joey's subtle indication, it may already be happening. And we may already be outnumbered. After all, I'm not like other people in his life. I'm actually here. My wife had always been a sound sleeper. She never snored, talked in her sleep, nor was she particularly restless. Oftentimes, she'd wake up in the same position she passed out in, with barely a wrinkle in the sheets around her. When the singing in the middle of the night began, I was perplexed, to say the least. Not only was this late-night, early-morning karaoke completely out of tune and downright painful to listen to, even though I knew her to have quite the lovely singing voice, but it seemed to be some sort of gospel music. I don't mean to be offensive to any fans of the genre, but I knew for a fact that it was not Jen's cup of tea. She'd never been a particularly religious type, but she was more inclined to sing along with pop or rhythm and blues when she had the urge. Her father was the pastor at a church in her old hometown, and he was all kinds of abusive and overbearing in her youth. It was his influence that inspired her to turn her back on the religion he clearly didn't understand himself, but that didn't stop her from being the most loving and caring person I ever met. With how muffled and gargled her voice was while she warbled the barely legible lyrics, I could only make out the occasional word. Praise her and cherish her were among the few that I could understand, but others, like curse his flock or cleanse the stain, sent a shiver up my spine. With one slight shake of her arm, I managed to wake her up, but she was completely unaware of why I chose to pull her from her sleep. Uh, what? She said, still groggy. What's wrong, hon? You, uh... <laughs> you were crazy singing in her sleep. I didn't know what else to say. I suppose I hadn't thought that far ahead when I made the semi-conscious decision to wake her. I was... I'm sorry, Jan. Must have been a weird dream or something. She nodded off halfway through her words. But once she returned to her regularly scheduled disturbance-free slumber, I knocked back out too. The remainder of the night was uneventful as always, so... I didn't even bring it up the following day, but when she began her guttural song a second time the following night, I got a little more concerned. Again, I prematurely yanked her from her sleep about halfway through her out-of-tune moaning, and once more she had nothing to offer. I don't know what to tell you, hon, she said the following morning when I brought up her new nightly tradition. Have you had any strange dreams or anything? I asked, unsure of what else to add. Maybe, I mean, I could be, but I don't remember anything. Did you, like, hear the song somewhere and can't get it out of your head or something? Babe, I don't even know what song you're talking about, she said, sounding like she was losing her patience with my inquisition. I don't have anything stuck in my mind I'm aware of. I don't have any answers for you. I'm sorry, okay? No, I'm sorry, I, I I don't know, it's just... It's weird, is all. You're usually such a sound... Will you just drop it, for Christ's sake? It's not like I'm doing it on purpose. She went from mildly annoyed to downright pissed in the blink of an eye. 
I just stood there for a moment, feeling like I'd gotten yelled at by my parents rather than the woman I loved. I could feel my face getting warm with embarrassment while she just stared at me with her hands on her hips. I could see the muscles in her face twitching while she clenched her jaw, so I just raised my hands as though I stared down the barrel of a gun. I backed away and left the room. Not only was Jin normally such a peaceful sleeper, but she was generally such a calm and composed person. Even at times I'd be losing my patience with the situation, she always handled them like a champ. I won't say we never had our fights, as any healthy couple does, but it would often take a lot more than a few concerned questions to cause her to lose her cool. As the days progressed... We made more casual conversation, and I didn't bring up her strange sleeping habits of late again. Before we laid down for the night, we made up in the uh, traditional manner, an act that left us both quite exhausted by the time it reached its conclusion. We fell asleep in each other's arms, which is something we didn't do as much as when we were younger. These things often get neglected after a solid decade of marriage, but my love for her never faltered. When the awful singing pulled me from my sleep for the third night in a row, Jin was no longer wrapped around me, but with her back flat against the sheets. I started to wake her again, but I thought it best to just let this thing run its course this time, even after it grew louder. Her back arched as the volume of her warbling increased, her shoulders and legs pressed to the mattress while her body contorted into something of an upside-down you. Praise her, oh, cherish her, smear the filth from her path, give her all you have to give, lest we feel her wrath. Her voice had escalated to a sound of madness, while the gargled moaning began to cause my stomach to churn. When I leaned over her body, deciding that I had to pull her out of this before she hurt herself, I screamed out in terror before I even realized. Her eyes were wide open while she yelled her words, but they were no longer the deep hazel brown I'd looked into for the better part of thirteen years, but a shimmering, almost glowing emerald green. When I finally convinced my shriek to calm down, I grabbed my wife by the shoulder, shaking her almost violently to break her from this safe, but she wouldn't let up. My ears were ringing with how loud her wailing song had grown, and I could barely make out my own yelling voice as I attempted to wake her. Praise her. Heal her. Let her into your soul. Feed her. Nourish her. Help her become whole. It was almost deafening, but no matter what I did, she wouldn't come out of it. Finally, after the noise was growing intolerable to bear, I slapped my hand against her face. In an instant... As her song transformed into a horrendous and anguished scream, she thrust her palms into my chest, sending me flying across the room into the wall. Before my spinning head left me unconscious below the large crack on my body and implanted into the drywall, I could see Jen sitting straight up in the bed, darting her head from side to side as if she was lost. When I came to, I was still on the floor with my head thumping and my back aching. It took considerable effort to get to my feet, but when I noticed my wife was gone, I tried to push my discomfort to the side. It was still dark outside, so I threw on every light switch in every room to find no trace of where she'd gone, only the front door wide open and the chilly night air breathing in through the opening. I could still feel the blood trickling down the back of my neck as I drove through the neighborhood in search of Jen. When I finally found her just walking down the sidewalk a good couple of miles from the house, I practically hopped the tires onto the curb in my enthusiasm to get her. Hey, hon, she said, seemingly in something of a daze when I ran up to her. Jen, what are you doing? Hmm? Oh, I... I'm not sure. She finally stopped walking when I grabbed her by the shoulder, standing in front of her to look her in the eyes. Though I was thrilled to see that he had reverted to their normal color scheme, I could tell her marbles hadn't quite returned yet. She was only wearing her sleep shorts and a tank top, and her skin felt as though it was freezing to my touch. You want to come back home with me? Huh? 
Yeah, let's do that. I'm sleepy. She was still in a trance while I buckled her into the passenger seat and was still zoned out over the short ride back to the house. When we arrived, I helped her out of her seat, picked her up, and carried her back inside. You're so sweet, she said with a light smile and a cute giggle as I laid her back onto the bed, pulling the blanket back over her still frigid flesh. I traced my fingers across her cheek and through her dark, wavy hair while she curled up beneath the covers. Night-night, she said groggily, closing her eyes while she nuzzled her body against the warmth of the bed. Sleep tight. For the next hour or so, I just watched her sleep. She didn't move or make a sound as she drifted away, but I was so scared she would begin her wailing song again. After a while, once I felt confident she was out for the night, I went to the bathroom to wash the oozing wound on the back of my head. It was still quite tender, but I hoped the four ibuprofen I knocked back would do their magic. When I finally climbed back into bed, I was reminded that my back was still throbbing pretty good too, so I rolled down on my side to face my beautiful wife. As my eyes grew heavier, I attempted to push aside the stabbing pain in my chest that sorely needed answers to what had become of the once kind-hearted and carefree woman I adored. I knew I would likely have to seek out professional help for her soon, but not tonight. Jen was still asleep when I awoke the following morning. Even though I knew my body could use a good deal more rest, my back was aching and stiff. After I got done with my shower, I checked back in to find her still knocked out. Honestly, as worried as I was about what had been going on with her, I hoped that her being able to get an extended rest would do her a world of good. While I was downstairs researching online to see if I could find any answers to the strange events of late, I heard the ceiling creaking from movement on the second floor. I sort of froze up for a second as though my parents were about to walk in and catch me browsing porn on my laptop. Rather than Jen inadvertently finding me looking up things she seemed to have no memory of. Given her reaction when I pushed the topic on her last time, I didn't want to inadvertently fuel another fight, even if the makeup session was more than worthy of a few harsh words. Either way, I didn't want to make things worse than they already were. When the creaking on the floor above me fell silent again, I decided to just shut down the computer and go check on my wife. I couldn't know if she remembered her late night stroll or effortlessly tossing me across the bedroom for that matter, but I had to know if she was back to herself or not. I crept up the stairs like a burglar, hoping to keep their home invasion secret, feeling almost silly about the way I was acting. I wasn't entirely sure why I felt compared to be so cloak and dagger about the simple act of checking on my wife after a crazy night, but I continued on that course nonetheless. When I reached the cracked open door to the bedroom, I still kept my actions as quiet as possible. I softly nudged the door, momentarily worried about potentially squeaky hinges alerting the room's only occupant to her impending guest. When I got inside, I saw Jen sitting on the side of the bed, facing away from me. She was leaned over with her hands, tinkering with something that I couldn't make out. It wasn't until the jingling music began to softly hum from what she held that another sharp chill ran the length of my spine once more. As I moved in closer, she began to rock from side to side, swaying to the tune clinking from what sounded like some sort of music box. When she began to hum along with the sound of that same rhythm she'd been warbling in her sleep for the past few nights, I felt fingers and toes begin to tremble. Even with it only being the melody of that song, her tone-deaf sleeping mouth would wail into the night. I could hear those words bouncing around in the back of my mind. Praise her, my wife softly whispered. Cherish her, she continued while she hummed the haunting tune. 
heal her. I muttered under my breath, barely aware I'd even spoke. Nourish her. Our voices spoke together as Jen turned to me, reaching her hand out to take mine. We left the house hand in hand with her still clutching the music box in the other. The hypnotic tune still carried on while we navigated the car through the neighborhood and out into the world beyond. I had no idea where we were headed, but my wife took care of the navigation. Left here, right there, stay on this road for 30 miles, and so on. Regardless of the fact that she'd not once turned the little brass key on the side of the simple wooden box since we left, the music carried on through the entirety of our journey. For hours, we darted from one highway to another, up and across back roads, only stopping to refuel. We didn't pull over to get anything to eat, as we had no hunger. We didn't pick up anything to drink at the gas station. We were not thirsty. We were on a quest. And that was all that mattered. It was some time after the sun had gone down that we finally reached our destination. I didn't recognize the old cemetery nor the wrought iron fence that surrounded it, but Jen seemed to know exactly where we were. She still moaned occasionally lyric to the haunting song while we got out of the car, though I no longer felt the urge to sing along. My wife wore a beaming smile as we left the pathway behind to veer hand in hand in between and around a variety of both simple and elegant tombstones. The graveyard was massive, housing the dead from decades long passed away, as well as some from more recent years. As we continued on, I noticed the dates carved into the stones growing older and older, while the air we breathed tasted more stale and unnatural the longer we wandered onwards. I still felt almost mentally vacant when we finally came to a large tomb at the very end of the farthest reach of the cemetery. Though we'd passed what I thought to be the very last row of headstones some ten minutes before, this one stood alone, with only the warped and bent iron pegs of the fence behind it. Jen smiled back at me while she let my hand slip from hers as she pulled open the large door to the almost cavernous-looking tomb. As soon as she crossed over the threshold, torches on either side of the wide room ignited, lighting up the otherwise darkened area. I could feel my knees begin to weaken when I strolled in behind her, seeing nothing more than a large concrete casket in the very center of the room. There was nothing decorative inside, only chipped and aged concrete walls and floors. When she set the music box onto the top of the casket, it sank about halfway in, causing thin grooves to bevel and spiral from around where it had sat in place, ending in a small circular hole in the center. When the lid of the music box opened with the music still reverberating against the sound walls, Jen reached inside, pulling out a long, jewel-encrusted dagger. She held it out to me, giving me a nod of permission to take it from her, for she smiled enthusiastically, lifting herself onto the casket. Nourish her, she said as she lay back with her head touching the side of the music box, which had closed itself shut once more. I barely felt in control of my own body as I approached where she lay, holding the dagger above me with both hands, smiling back at the beautiful woman I loved with all my heart. Make her whole, I said, readying myself to force the blade down into her chest, allowing her blood to flow freely onto the waiting mouth of the goddess beneath the concrete slab. The haunting tune still echoed from the box above my wife's head, resonating against the ancient walls surrounding us. Jennifer gave me another nod, signifying the time had come. We smiled warmly to one another as I thrust the dagger downwards with all my might and passion. When I pulled the car back into the driveway, the home that I shared with my wife, I was still very puzzled by the events that led us to somewhere on the other side of the country. I just sat, 
staring at the front door with the morning sun beaming down from above, feeling less than inspired to get out of the car I'd already spent far too much time in over the past 24 hours. I could recall everything in vivid detail. The song that captured my mind and senses, the seemingly endless trip to the ancient boneyard, and even the glee I felt as I thrust the dagger downwards. I still couldn't figure out if it was my own will or something else that guided that blade from Jen and into the simple wooden box, but as soon as the impact silenced that hypnotic melody for good, both my wife and I snapped out of whatever trance had taken a hold of us. We were both shaken up by the whole experience, and I still can't believe that I came so close to impaling the woman I love, but I can only hope this whole ordeal is over now. When we finally got back into our home, cleaned ourselves up, and got some food on our empty stomachs, we did a lot of talking. It seemed that the music box had been delivered to the house about a week ago, with no return address on the package. Jen just assumed it was some sort of gift for one reason or another, but as soon as she cranked that key for the first time, it set its seeds in her mind. Though she wasn't fully aware of it, her sleeping mind could not escape the spell it weaved, a spell that took hold of me when I heard the song as well. Even after I silenced the damn thing, it took a minute for us to really take in what almost happened. When we did, we both beat and stomped at that box until it was little more than tiny gears and splinters of wood. As for the dagger, we tossed into a river we passed by on our return trip, though I couldn't tell you for the life of me where it was located. Truth be told, even though I remember those days quite clearly, I have no idea where we went that night. I don't know the route we took, the direction we went, or even what part of the country we were in, but everything else down to me holding that knife above my beloved wife's heart, I see every time I close my eyes. We have no clue as to who sent the music box to us, but neither of us will be so trusting of anonymous mail anymore. At this point, I think, even if we'd gotten an unsigned envelope, with 50 grand inside, we tossed that shit in the fireplace without a second thought. We may never know who or what was behind that mysterious package, nor the identity of the occupant in that tomb so many miles away, but I'm grateful for whatever guided my aim that night. Not only did I almost murder the woman I love, but I can't even imagine what we may have set loose upon the world if I'd hit my mark. I wasn't supposed to be driving that night. Pat was our designated driver, but they forgot about halfway through the night and started drinking heavily. I, having nursed the same cocktail up until I saw them getting red in the face and wobbly, knew my libations were then and there, and that their responsibility was now mine. I was annoyed, but since I hadn't intended on getting shit-faced that evening, I suppose Pat thought sobriety was wasted on them and figured I'd all but offered to take their place. In any case, once the night was done, I helped Pat and our friends, Cynthia and James, into the car and slipped into the driver's seat. Pat was mumbling something about what a great friend I was and got nothing but daggers from me in return. The other two passed out before they even buckled up, forcing me to lean over them like a mother to secure them in place. Was I this bad when I drink? Another flash of annoyance hit me. They could all sleep soundly, leaving me alone, having to stay alert and awake to play taxi for them. What's more, I wasn't so keen on driving specifically Pat home. See, there's this tunnel between their house and Central Town. And while it's just an ordinary tunnel, as far as everyone else is concerned, I can't stand it. It makes my skin crawl, because something that happened when I was a kid. Honestly, it scares the shit out of me. I usually take a different route, just so I can avoid it, but doing so adds an hour to the trip, and at two in the morning in a car that stank of crusted puke, I made the mistake of picking the tunnel. I want to be clear that when I said the tunnel scared me, 
I could never have predicted what happened that night. When I was a kid, my brother told me the tunnel was the mouth of a giant, and the only way to survive was to hold my breath the whole way through. Stupid, in hindsight, but kids believe the weirdest superstitions, so I held my breath until I couldn't. Until the world was almost nothing but darkness, with a few small spots of light. And then I let in the faintest of inhales and heard a shriek coming from the other side of the tunnel. I was convinced I'd made the giant aware of me, and now we were going to die. Can you imagine? Expressing the genuine, honest-to-goodness fear of death at that age. Now, of course, since I'm writing this, I didn't die in the belly of a monster. Instead, I hyperventilated with my hand slapped over my mouth, bracing myself for the worst. Until we came upon a wreck. Someone had lost control of their vehicle and had driven right into the tunnel wall. That was the sound that I'd heard. I didn't see a simple accident, though. Through the lens of a child's imagination, I saw the twisted metal as a car gnashed by the teeth of a giant. I saw the accident as somehow being my fault, all because I took a breath. I never wanted to go through that tunnel again after that. And if I had to, I held my breath the entire time just in case. As I got older, that fear morphed into an avoidance of the tunnel. Which leads us to this story. To me, pulling up along on the side of the road near the mouth of the tunnel with my three friends passed out in the passenger seats. I think I was more anxious than scared. Something about the way the wind moved through the entrance put me on edge. I could hear the howl even with the windows rolled up. I figured I'd wait for another car to drive in at first. It felt a little silly, but you know what they say. Safety in numbers. It wasn't long before a little Corolla passed me and was engulfed in the darkness. I hit the gas and followed behind, trying not to be too creepy about it. It was nice to see the taillights blazing the trail in front of me. I followed it to about the halfway point of the tunnel, to the point where I used to start struggling to hold my breath. I could feel myself unintentionally holding it now. So far... It was going fine. I even started to relax a little. It was the calm before the storm. Suddenly, something weird happened. The car in front of me began to shrink as though it had violently sped up. I accelerated to give chase, not wanting to lose its light, but no matter how fast I went, the distance between us only grew. I couldn't hear the revving of its engine, and I couldn't understand why or how it was going so fast, so quietly. I kept shrinking, illuminating what seemed like ever-encroaching tunnel walls. I would have stopped and turned around if I wasn't sure it was only an optical illusion. Likewise, I would have turned around if I'd realized I should have been long out of the tunnel by then. Sometimes you miss the forest for the trees, and that Corolla was my tree. By the time the Corolla became a blip on the horizon, I realized I was white-knuckling the steering wheel. I stopped focusing on my convoy partner, slowed, and took in the surroundings. Where was the left lane? Gone, I realized. I was tucked between the narrow tunnel walls with the roof so low if I'd been driving a van, the top would have scraped against it. My first thought was that I'd somehow veered into a maintenance tunnel, and I was lucky I hadn't scratched Pat's car in the process. And then I noticed how dark it was. With the Corolla now completely out of view and no hanging lights, 
I could only see as far as my headlights shined. Everything beyond that was pitch black, like in the deepest recesses of the ocean. I wasn't sure how far into the maintenance tunnel I was, nor whether it looped back to rejoin the main road. I didn't have room to turn the car around, and the thought of backing up the whole way filled me with a potent sense of dread. I didn't want to not look forward. Something told me I needed to keep my eyes on the road ahead. What was safer? The road not traveled? Or the road I could barely see because Pat cheaped out and didn't get LEDs for his taillights? I swallowed a knot of apprehension, imagining myself in the throat of the giant. I tried to open the door, but I found the walls so tight I'd only had room to squeeze one foot out. Had the tunnel gotten narrower? No, there was no way. I closed the door and decided to keep going. If nothing else, I hoped this tunnel would widen enough for me to turn at some point, but I took it slow, the tires crackling beneath me. There was movement in my peripheral vision, and my eyes shot to the side view mirror where I could have sworn I saw the concrete buckle behind me. I grit my teeth and tried to shove Pat awake to no avail. I could feel my skin, every inch of it. It's like I was suddenly hyper aware of myself. It itched. Blood rushed to my head, and I swear I could feel my eyeballs move. I needed to expand. I needed to get out of this oppressive closeness. The walls were getting tighter. My throat was getting tighter. Breathing was getting harder. Was it my imagination? I smacked Pat in desperation, and although I wanted to try Cynthia and James, I couldn't bring myself to look in the back seat. I, I don't know why, but something in my gut told me if I turned around, I'd find a concrete wall encasing me in the front. I don't know whether it was stubborn or stupid not to turn around. I don't know if it was false hope or logic or fear. I have no idea what compelled me to keep going even as I began to hear the scraping of metal on concrete. Even as my nails dug into the steering wheel and splintered, even as I gripped my teeth, trying to will the tunnel to release me. That's when I heard a slap. It was strong. Wham! Against Pat's door. When I dared to look, the blood drained from my face. There was something in the wall, something coming out of the wall, more like. Rocky fingers attached the palms, squeezing against the glass. The wall rippled like a wave, and the hands rode it, giving chase. I sped up, not knowing whether I was being led like a lamb to the slaughter or closer to my salvation. The hands kept pace, following me at 80 kilometers an hour, like it was nothing. The walls were getting tighter. I was entombed. In darkness, the walls were moving, solid but malleable, soft like liquid concrete, but when they hit the car, sparks flew. I realized I was screaming. I pushed down on the accelerator, testing the speed of the car. The hands followed, more hands. I could see them in the rearview mirror, in the side mirrors, in front of me. They were everywhere, scratching and tapping at the car, trying to get in. I was still screaming so loud, my throat turned to sandpaper. Faces began to pull away from the walls, mouths and eyes and noses stretched out like shapes pushed through fabric. I couldn't tell whether I was still screaming or if the yowls I heard were coming from these concrete mouths. I just knew I needed to keep going. I needed to reach safety. I couldn't let them catch us. Catch me. Suddenly, I heard the familiar click of the door handle being pulled. Pat's door. In any other context, the sound wouldn't be so heart-stoppingly terrifying. In this one, it pushed me beyond the edge in a place so deep into the well of horror that I became almost numb. 
My nervous system couldn't handle the sensory and panic overload. I think it's resignation. I think the realm beyond fear is a kind of acceptance to your fate. To your inevitable death. It's a kindness your body offers you in the last moments of your life so that an imprint of fear isn't left behind when your soul leaves your body. Or maybe it's for your loved ones, so they can see that you died peacefully and can move on easier than if you kicked the bucket in wild thrashes of agonizing fear, begging for help and sobbing. Point being, when the door began to jostle open, I felt this wave of near calm and closed my eyes to let it happen. I took my hands off the steering wheel and slowly released the gas pedal. And then there was silence. There was no longer the grinding sound of metal on concrete, no screaming, no tapping or scraping or anything else like that. I opened my eyes in time to see the car puttering out of the tunnel finally, with the night sky blissfully far away and the tree line giving me a very wide berth. The false calm turned in relief. The relief soured into fear as I thought about what had just happened, and it all sank in. You hear stories of injured people capable of incredible feats to save themselves, and the moment they reach safety, they collapse. That was me, essentially. I drove the car a bit further down the road, and then pulled off to the side. The stress had me shaking violently, and I could barely get my legs out of the car. I fell on all fours. I must have looked like a drunk. As I reeled on the grass, I could hear Cynthia and James waking up and asking questions from the back seat. Trivial, why are we stopped, or where are we? I couldn't care less what they were saying. Now, I know what you're thinking. The second I closed my eyes and accepted my fate, I was freed from the tunnel. It must have been all a bad dream or some weird allegory for dealing with my childhood fear. You would be wrong. The car was scraped to all hell. There were dents in the metal shaped like large hands. And then there was Pat. Pat, the designated driver who got drunk and forced me to take their place that night. Pat, my friend since grade school. Pat, who for the duration of the tunnel had been unresponsive to my screams and shakes and pleas to wake up. Pat, who was dead. Their face twisted in abject horror as though they woke up just in time to see death coming for them. Pat, who hadn't had time to go through the stages of fear and reach that bliss before the end. The reason, I now believe that the peace is more for everyone else's sake than one's own. Because I know they died screaming. I know exactly what they felt like in those final moments because I'd felt every rung from that ladder of fear, but I'd survived to tell the tale. Ultimately, Pat's death was ruled a heart attack. Officials think I fell asleep at the wheel, causing the car to veer into the wall before regaining control, which makes no sense. The scratches were on all surfaces of the car, even the undercarriage. But I suppose they were looking for an explanation, whether true or false. As for the tunnel, I don't intend to ever drive through it again. But from my research, I know one thing I didn't know when it happened. There is no maintenance tunnel. There's just the main road. Which means the only mistake I made that night was ever driving into the mouth of the beast in the first place. It 
As I stood at the base of the long lane beneath, staring up at my distant destination, I suppose my perceptions of that house were being tolerated by my recent breakup. The plan had been to attend our studies in Prague together. Instead, I stood alone against the parching summer winds, studying a lengthy alley that carved its way up the precipitous hill with ancient laziness. Lost in brooding need for motion, I ignored my initial unease and slipped into the cramped canyon where the serpentine alley began. The walk was quiet, taxing and lonely, but passed without note in a blur of regretful and nostalgic thoughts. I was in another country, but I had not yet left the old one behind. As I emerged from the narrow shade, sweaty and bitter, the hill's crowning residence greeted me with a resurgence of disquiet. The high house had once been noble and sat apart towering over its environs like an aging patriarch with a tired back. The fourth and highest floor carried a visibly dangerous tilt toward the terminal precipice of that final lot, an illusion I attributed to the hill's steep angle and the stone's weathered patterns. Shadows streamed from sharp carvings, casting incomprehensible patterns across the wasteland of cracked medieval pavement that otherwise ran bright under dry winds. I was not the only student staying at the Moravec house, and this was hardly the first year that its surviving matriarch had hosted academics, but I still had to force myself to approach. An inexplicable revulsion held me back, trying to warn me away. But there was no specific reason I could gather to truly give up and return to my home country. And she was there, in my home country. Disquiet or no, I couldn't go back. I gave a gentle knock on the wide wooden door. An airy breeze brought a sigh past my ears. I looked back at the cobblestone lane, but the midday sun and patterned shade held nothing but emptiness and the odd tiny weed dancing in the wind. The door swung open, and I turned forward in a sudden embarrassed surprise. A white-haired woman stood waiting, a pleasant smile on her face. She carried a slight hunch to match that of a tired house itself, but her clear blue eyes still shined with a particular energy. Her calm and positive tone carried only a hint of an accent. Our last student, you've arrived. Lady Moravec, I responded, following the culture advice my advisor had given me. It felt odd to address someone with a noble like that given that she stood before me in jeans and a faded orange shirt that seemed reminiscent of earlier decades. This was not an old woman. This was a woman who happened to have aged. Her deeply wrinkled face curled up in genuine humor. <laughs> Dear, really, call me Anita. She pulled a cell phone and typed in my name and details. So that I'll remember, she explained before returning it to her pocket. I stepped inside after her, and immediately shuddered from the chill within. As she led me into the house, I saw almost immediately why she needed to record my details. Eleven other students sat in a long dining room. Lunch had finished at least an hour before, but the plates remained on the table while cultures clashed and friendships were forged. I was in no mood to meet people, and Anita seemed to notice. Instead of introducing me immediately, she showed me the way up a surprisingly narrow set of stone steps that I figured must have been for the servants, back when the house had employed them. The chill deepened as we climbed. Is it just you here these days? I asked, adjusting my backpack and holding myself closer against the drop in temperature. She kept moving but threw a smile back. If the cold's bothering you, I can get you a sweater. <laughs> no, I, I'm fine. I lied. At first I assumed the house's ancient construction kept it cold, but we passed a vent, and the icy air brought me a shiver. I'd seen signs of modern renovations in the front hallway, and that was true here as well. We came to the top of the stairs, and I blinked against the sudden change. 
White was the dominant color here. The long and close hallway was incredibly clean and populated only by a decorative little table with two plastic flowers and small vases. I immediately found myself thinking of the place as icy, given the painfully chill airflow rolling toward us and the harsh lack of color. Suppressing an oncoming chattering of my teeth, I forced a smile and followed her in my room. She had assigned me one at the end of the long hallway, because I had arrived last. That was fair enough, but I was already considering the walk back to the stairs, a trek that I would have to endure with each departure and return. The room itself was plain, spartan, and serviceable. There was no air vent within, so the temperature was higher and the patterns were all brown. Glad to escape the chill whites, I ducked within and dropped my backpack on the floor. A moment later, I thought to thank my new host, so I popped my head out. She had already left me to my own devices, but she had not departed entirely. I watched her open a nearly invisible white closet, pull out a vacuum, and begin cleaning the very scant dirt my shoes had left behind. I suppose it was necessary to keep the smooth alabaster wood floor clean, but something about her movement and manner came off as a bit intent, or even manic. Taking care to avoid any noise, I closed my doors and then went about assessing my new living quarters. The single window was made of thick, double-paned glass. Beyond, I could see a great deal of Prague and nothing of the winding lane I traveled earlier. The window faced the hill's precipice then, and I peered down at a dizzyingly steep series of rooftops that dropped haphazardly into a sea of buildings far below. Hoping for a better view down, I tried to open the window, but found that it was set wholly into the wall. Not only could it not be opened, it had been constructed to purposely lack the ability. I suppose that was necessary to keep guests from falling out. There was no airflow in my room, however, so I wondered if it wouldn't begin to feel a little claustrophobic over the course of the semester. I suppose that I wasn't really intended to spend much time there. The house did have a sprawling layout that probably allowed for privacy through sheer size. Shredding off my continued unease, I headed back into the icy halls. I did see the narrow stairs back down to the front, but I also looked in the other direction. The hallway terminated at a junction, where a fancy portrait hung on the wall. I approached it, studying the image of an older and respectable man. His heavy eyes gazed internally at something in the distance, and I knew instinctively who this was. Rasta Moravec, the man of the house, and Anita's late husband. I'd been told not to bring him up. Standing there in front of the picture, I pulled out my phone and looked at him. His respectable portrait seemed a sham as I read paragraph after paragraph about the scandals of his life. There had been rumors about gambling, about successful shady dealings to recover family wealth, and about womanizing. The article also included an image of a woman I recognized. It was Anita, lacking a number of decades, and quite beautiful for the change. She stood with her husband, smiling with that same particular brightness. I stared at first because she caught the eye so strongly, and then because a strange shock ran through me. It was brighter, but much less warm, but I knew the pattern. She was wearing that same orange shirt. It was a picture of the two of them, from before all the scandals. I suppose that that shirt meant something to her. A subtle sigh reached my hearing. I looked up, confused. Had that been the same sound from outside? The revving of the vacuum startled me, and I hurriedly put my phone away as Anita's swift cleaning motions brought her closer. She kept her eyes on the traces of dirt I'd left out on the sheer white floor. Please, join the others downstairs. I did as she asked, wondering if I hadn't heard a slight tone of anger in her voice. The other students pulled me in from the first moment, demanding my story and friendship, and I gave them what I could. They were nice enough, 
but my mind was still on a girl I knew I would never speak to again. That and the oddness of the house and its sole caretaker. School started. And I had less time to think about it, but nobody else seemed to find it odd that she wore the same orange shirt every single day. She kept it immaculate, just like the house, so the others chalked it up to her being set in her ways. I heard that same odd sigh twice more over the next three months, but I imagined it had to have come from the air system. Because my room was unsuitable for walking pursuits, I often wandered the house and eventually found a library. In addition to a huge range of first print classics, there was also an entire section filled with medical texts. Each had been leafed through in great detail and written upon with intent. Notes mirrored almost every margin. They were a bit odd, but close enough to modern. I'd intended to ask Anita about them until the nature of the notes changed. You bastard. It was probably my tenth time pursuing the dusty and unused library, and my third time examining those medical books, so I had to stare for a moment to comprehend what I was seeing. Someone had jotted questions above and then answered them. Someone had noted important sections below, between, you don't get to leave me, I'll find out who she is, I'll find out who all of them are. I swallowed down a return of that unease I'd felt my first day, and then carefully placed the books back the way I'd found them. I kept my thoughts to myself for a time, and only perused my concerns in a roundabout manner. The twelve of us had finished dinner, and a few glasses of wine had been had, courtesy of our absent hosts. I knew who would speak most freely. Wright was an American, and the drink went straight to his mouth every time. At an opportune time, I leaned in close to him and said, Say, do you know anything about how Rasta died? His dumb grin told me I'd struck gold. He gave me a conspiratorial whisper that I was sure everyone in the room could hear. My only saving grace was their drunken conversations had them riveted to other topics. Rasta Moravec, Wright let out with a burst of air, and gave a great nod. <laughs> Disappeared. Disappeared? I asked, a terrible suspicion coming over me. Not gonna find that on a Wikipedia, are you? Heard it from a local chick I hooked up with my first week here. Only the locals know about it. Whisper it, you know? I tried to sound only casually interested. When did he disappear? Ten years, I think, he responded before leaping up. Bathroom time. He was gone in an instant, but a dark heaviness remained in his absence. I took my leave and headed to my room, cramped though it was. I sat between close brown walls, staring at my sealed window. What had Anita done? I absently bit through each of my nails, one by one, before I decided I had to investigate further. The main complication was clear. Lady Moravec never left the house. She loved the house, and kept it chill, austere, and mattingly clean. That gave me the idea. During another night of drinking, I gave Wright an anonymous gift. A potted plant something which he found uniquely hilarious for reasons beyond my ken, and he proceeded to almost immediately trip and smash it, exactly as I'd hoped. Anita raced out from rooms unknown and proceeded to clean in a panic. I slipped away. Her room lay at the very back of the house, and I hurried toward it without my shoes. In socks alone, I left no trace of my passage on the stark floor. The door to her room creaked open with a blast of icy air. I braced myself for the coldest room yet and crept inside. Everything within was white. The bed and all of its sheets were white. The desk was white. 
There was no window at all. I'd seen many of the signs, but I knew now that Lady Moravec contained some measure of hidden madness. This simply wasn't normal. The desk drawer slipped open without resistance, and I leafed through several white journals I found within. He loves me. I'm so happy to have my Rasta with me. I checked the corporate text at the very front of the journal. He was only two years old. Either Anita was completely mad, or, when that sigh broached my senses for the fifth time since I'd come, I finally heard it for what it was. A distant, weak, and hopeless moan. The truth struck me with an almost physical thump to the chest. Rasta Moravec was still in the house. Electrified by my new understanding, I began looking around the room with sharper eyes, like the closets in the hallways, nearly invisible white doors that had just been set into the walls there. They were set high, near arm level, and too small to be accesses to another room, but I was still deadly curious. I approached one and slid the clean white wood panels apart. An empty cube of space sat beyond, also bright white, except for a single crimson little splatter. A drop of blood sat in that cupboard, and it had not yet congealed. It was fresh. A creak sounded in the distance, and I hurriedly closed the cupboard, checked the desk, and slipped back out. The house's maze-like setup lent me a dozen paths to escape. I made it in my room, put my shoes back on, and then casually rejoined the dinner party in the dining room. Nobody had been the wiser. If anyone had thought about it, I would have told them I'd just gone to the washroom. I laughed along with their jokes and listened to their tales, but my mind was solely on the undeniable fact that something terrible had been going on in that house for ten years. Was Rasta locked up somewhere? Was Anita torturing him? Burdened with my horrible suspicions, I couldn't help but feel completely alone. The girl I loved should have been there to help. She would have known what to do. She'd been bright, strong, and smart. I didn't understand why we'd ended, and I was far from over it even months later. And winter was coming on, so my time spent in the house only increased. I used every moment of free time manipulating dirtiness in the house so that I would have a chance to explore each and every room one by one. If Rasta was in the house, there had to be a way to find him. I couldn't simply call the police. That had all been done ten years ago, apparently, and they'd found nothing. Without any evidence, I'd look insane. My search took me deep into the inner workings of the house, most especially in my own room. After several days of work, I'd managed to remove a panel in the wall without damage. Beyond ran a great many wires, tubes, and so on. Those things I expected. There was one deviation from those expectations. Several little glass tubes that ran from somewhere deep in the wall to somewhere else deep in the wall. Extremely small fibers sat within each. I stared at them for days and even purchased a magnifying glass, but all I saw was dirty yellow with the traces of red. What thin fibers would be yellow with traces of red? I looked up wires, manufacturing, house hardwares. I couldn't find a match but these tubes were a clue. I focused my explorations on the numerous hidden panels in the house, tracing the glass. Many spread out in branching patterns through the walls, often terminating into hundreds of very small glass tubes. What was I seeing? I still had no idea. I traced them to the other direction, finding that they got fewer in number and thicker as I headed toward the heart of the house, Moravec. By then, I'd grown used to the internal bone chill and felt one with it. 
this house, this environment, carried a bleak madness that I knew had infected me. Anita had become obsessed with keeping her womanizing husband, and I had become obsessed with freeing him from her. Anything to keep me from thinking about what was missing in my life. A major break occurred late December of that year. I hadn't gone to class in the last month. I needed time to continue my search. I was glad for it, too, because it was during one of those hours that I was supposed to have been absent in the house that I finally found something important. It was a closet within a closet, containing a hidden apparatus that pumped in and out like some sort of lung. The thickening tubes connected to it directly, and I managed to determine that this air system was separate from the icy air vents. My immediate thought was that she was keeping Rasta somewhere isolated, with its own environment. That would have avoided a number of problems that would otherwise have exposed his presence in the house. She was smart. I'd guessed it, based on her study of the medical text. But now I knew. Those manic and sharp blue eyes hid piercing calculation. I knew that now, too, because I had the sense that she was on to me. I hadn't given myself away, and I'd made no mistake, but she seemed to see it in me somehow. Did madness recognize madness? She made no immediate move against me. I hesitated for a few days out of fear, but then resumed my search when I felt I had no other choice. I mapped out the entire house and found no missing space. The entirety of House Moravec was drawn out in my hidden notes and there were no extra rooms. I even rented a sounder and gone over every inch of the basement. It was that drawing that struck home the horrifying truth of what I'd been mapping. I stared at it, highly aware of everything around me. My brown room hummed quietly with the systems around it. Snow fell outside the window, and I was holding a picture of something I recognized. There was no more need for the game. In a shaking fury, I stormed through the freezing white hallways, heading straight for Anita's room. She sat within, writing in her white journal. She looked up with icy determination. I see from the look in your eyes that you understand. I shook with the strain of repressed violence. Show me. Her hunch disappeared as she stood up straight with ease and grace. An affection. Another lie. She moved to the cabinets in her bedroom walls and opened the one I'd found the drop of blood in. Are you sure? I kept my response quiet, but fierce. Show me. She pressed a hidden square and the cubicle space lifted. It had always been a sort of secret dumbwaiter. I never thought to look deeper into it because the space was so simply too small for a person. It was the perfect size, however, for the head of an aging, womanizing patriarch. The glass tubes moved with the mechanical case that came up. I understood now what had been done. Anita turned around and looked at me, and smiled. He could never leave me. It was what I'd expected. The tubes had been mapping and had been splayed out like a circulatory system, and I'd found the lungs. Rasta had never been in any room of the house. He'd been in the house itself, splayed out through every wall and floor. The tubes held his arteries and veins, and this box held his head. I hadn't expected, however, that the system had actually worked. Rasta Moravec was still alive. He stared at me, trying his best to whisper for help. 
Lady Moravec studied me with a bright gaze. Are you going to call the police? I shuddered. I have to. This is monstrous. Insane. Anita, do you see what you've done? She gave a slow nod. He can never leave me or this house. I have everything I want. She took a step closer. Before you inform anyone, I should tell you. I've invited your ex-girlfriend, the one you always talk about. She'll be coming here for the next semester. You could simply keep this to yourself and stay. The house will need someone to take care of it after I'm gone. Before that, I can help you learn. I froze, trying to comprehend what she was offering. She, too, had a partner who had disappointed her in trying to leave. But she'd taken away that disappointment through science and madness. When I didn't respond, Anita moved to her desk, pulled out a medical textbook, and held it out. I'd like to say I turned it down. Hey everyone, before we get into tonight's story, I wanted to remind you all about Universal Yums, with Father's Day being right around the corner. I think this would make the perfect gift. If you've been here for a little while, you already know the deal, but if you're new here, maybe this is your first time hearing about it, let me break it down. Universal Yums, when you sign up, they send you a box from a random country in the world full of snacks and candies from that country. Once you sign up, you can get it every single month, for as long as you want. They make incredible gifts for people who want to travel, people who have traveled, people who can't travel right now. It's a really, really fun thing to do with friends or with family, and like I said, it makes an amazing gift. I got one for my mom for Mother's Day, and she absolutely loved it. Her box came from France, and there was a lot of really, really good stuff in there. I've gotten some incredible stuff in the boxes they've sent me as well, and I think... It's, it's fun for everyone. So, if you're interested in trying it out, getting something for your dad, or whoever your parental figure is this Father's Day, and helping out the channel, check out the link at the top of the description. It really, really helps, and I really appreciate it. Take care, everyone, and let's get ahead and go into this story. As far back as I can remember... My father insisted that I had a special destiny. I was to follow in his footsteps and become a Walmart greeter. I remember one Friday evening back when I was in kindergarten, when my father came home from a staff meeting. I ran up to him and asked, How was work, Daddy? His eyes lit up and he said, I had the most amazing day, the most amazing job on the planet. Holding his blue Walmart vest in the crook of his arm, he gave me one of those effortless, one-armed, wrap-around hugs that made me feel both warm and loved. In my mind, being a Walmart greeter was situated somewhere between an F-14 fighter pilot and a ninja turtle. It was a career steeped in mystery that promised untold adventure. My father never attempted to dispel this illusion, never said the job was demeaning, and never suggested that maybe better occupations existed. I had no reason to doubt him. I adored him with all of my heart. The notion that my father would lie to me was an alien thought outside of the realm of possibility. A couple years later, in grade two, our teacher sent home a newsletter inviting parents to come visit our classroom and tell all about their careers. We heard from a nurse, a mechanic, and a plumber. After work one evening, I asked my dad if he wanted to speak to my class to tell them about his career as a Walmart greeter. <laughs> oh no, he said, shaking his head. It's an immense responsibility that only a few can handle. Besides, if everyone had their dreams come true, I'd no longer be special, right? I was disappointed, but I understood. Cheer up, my little raptor, he said, revealing a bag of assorted plastic dinosaurs. Look what I picked up from work. 
Elated, I jumped and poured the contents on the kitchen table. I selected a jet black T-Rex and passed it to my father. This is for you. <laughs> Thanks, he said. His broad smile was almost too large for his face. <laughs> I'll cherish that always. In grade three, a new kid moved in down the street. A hellion named Colin. As soon as we met, he took a special interest in making my life a living hell. I remember it was recess, and I was sitting alone eating a fruit roll-up in the cafeteria. Colin sat across from me and said, Hey, I saw your dad working down at Walmart. My eyes lit up. I was so proud of my father. Cool, I said. Isn't he awesome? That's what I'm going to do when I grow up. Colin threw his head back laughing. <laughs> really? You're going to work at Walmart too? I guess being a dumbass runs in the family. He said it loud enough for the other kids to hear, and a couple of goons sidled up along Colin, smelling blood. I was mortified. This was the first time I'd ever hear anyone criticize my dad's job. I'd never questioned it before. Why would I? My father always assured me that he had the best job in the world. The bell rang before I could muster a reply. As I walked away, I heard Colin say, Can you believe that dumbass wants to work at Walmart? After school, I sauntered home and cried in my room. My dad knocked softly on the door and asked, What's up, kiddo? I dried my eyes and tried to explain between sobs. The kids at school teased me because, because you're a Walmart greeter sat down on the bed beside me and gently rubbed my back. They make fun of what they don't understand. They cannot comprehend how special my job is, how it has the power to make all of our dreams come true. Trust me. I choked on spit and sputtered. Okay, I'll trust you. I gave him a big hug and said, I love you, Dad. He squeezed back and said, I love you too, son. Afterwards, we watched Jurassic Park and pretended we were dinosaurs. I was a velociraptor, and he was the mighty T-Rex. The encounter with Colin at recess was a preview for the downhill slide my life would take. From that point forward, non-stop inescapable bullying soon came to define my existence. Colin had an amazing talent for harassment. He skillfully tuned my classmates against me, even kids that I thought were my friends. He came up with a hateful nickname, Wally Walmart. Every time someone said that name, it felt like a mason jar of acid was tossed onto my face. I couldn't go out for lunch or walk the hallways without hearing that hateful moniker. I endured years of insults and harassment. Eventually, the constant degradation ate away at my self-esteem and I soon began to seriously question my father's plan. I was in grade 5 when I finally built up the nerve to confront my father. Hey, Dad, I said. What if I don't want to become a Walmart reader? Initially, he looked shocked, but... Then he sighed and his features relaxed. He sat down beside me and said, I knew this question would come up one day. I can't say I haven't been dreading it. Never lose sight of our goal. You have to trust me on this. It'll all make sense one day. But what if I want to do something else? Like become a doctor or a fireman? I said. He shook his head. No. You must push those thoughts from your head. You must stay focused and stick to the plan. And you have a great responsibility. When you turn 18, you're going to become a Walmart greeter and work alongside me. And that is final. But, I said, no buts. Trust me. He never lost his temper, but I could tell I'd hit a nerve. I let it drop then, but the thought continued to linger and fester in my mind. 
In grade six, my dad started seeing this nice lady named Lois. She always came by on Friday nights just before the weekly staff meetings. Without fail, she greeted me with a bag of assorted candies. She guessed correctly that sugar was a golden ticket to secure my approval. And then one day, she stopped coming by. I recall my dad was really upset. This was extraordinarily out of character. He was always in high spirits, even after a long day of work. I finally understood my father's mood when we went to Lois's funeral. I asked him what happened and was told that she had had a stroke. I remember I was filling a plate with sweets at her memorial service when I heard from an adjoining room my dad arguing with a bearded man. Maury, you gotta understand. The rock needs to be fed. We have no choice. I'd seen him before. He was one of my father's co-workers. I know, my father replied. I just... I just wish it didn't have to be her. Who else then? You? Your son? The man placed his hand on my father's shoulder, but he brushed it aside and stormed off. It was one of the few times I'd ever really seen my father upset. I wanted to follow him, tell him everything was going to be okay, and comfort him like he always comforted me. I had so many questions. I wanted to know what my father and the bearded man were arguing about. I I wanted to know why Lois's casket was closed when she had a stroke. And I wanted to know why everything smelled so strongly of ozone. I never asked any of these questions, figuring it was not a good time. Instead, I went back to my plate of sweets. As I grew into adolescence, I took routinely to defying my father's wishes. The constant refrain of, trust me, was growing thinner, and the elaborate fantasy he had spent my life building was crumbling. Soon I came to absolutely loathe the idea of becoming a Walmart greeter. Every time I thought about it, my mind was thrust into the nightmare gauntlet of jeers and insults hurled at me by my peers, and since my father was responsible for this, by extension, I began to hate him as well. If not for me... I would not be Wally Walmart. There's no goddamn way I'm going to be a Walmart greeter, I shouted at my 13th birthday. Since I was a social pariah, it was just the two of us. Please, you're still young, he said. You'll understand when you're older. Trust me. No, I shouted. I know I can do better than that. Why won't you tell me what's so special about that stupid job? He paused for a moment. It almost looked like he was going to explain everything and finally reveal the arcane truths of his so-called wonderful job. Look, he said, I cannot tell you much. You know that. But understand that standing at the front of the store is just a small part. I know what you do, I shouted. You smile and nod at people. That's it. I was screaming myself hoarse. All that resentment was pouring out. As I escalated, so did my father. No, he hollered back. You cannot comprehend the feeling of freedom that is both primal and ancient. If you just stick to the plan, touch the rock of dreams, you will experience a life that few before you have ever contemplated. Rock of dreams? What does that even mean? I demanded. He looked at me right in the eyes, pursed his lips, and said, I've already said too much. When you were younger, it was so much easier. You remember? We'd played dinosaurs, and you believed everything I said. I need you to remember what that was like. I need you to trust me. I'd heard that a million times. I stormed away and slammed my bedroom door behind me. The bullying followed me into high school. Now, I was Wally Walmart to an even larger, more intimidating group of teenagers, and Colin was always there, like a tumor. Colin was the innovative bully. He managed to turn Wally Walmart into a song that all my classmates somehow managed to memorize. 
even my math teacher, accidentally referred to me once as Wally. <sighs> my mind went into directions so morbid that I surprised myself. Sitting in class, I daydreamed about all the unspeakably horrible things I wanted to do to Colin. In biology, I imagined giving Colin a case of Ebola and watching as he bled out from every orifice. In math class, I fantasized, stabbing him in the eye with the pointy end of a compass and then slitting his throat with a sharpened protractor. In gym class, I envisioned Colin being pummeled with dodgeballs, pleading for mercy as all my tormentors turned on him. My favorite murder fantasy, one that I kept revisiting, involved me turning into a velociraptor and ripping Colin into tattered, bloody shreds. Imagining his agonized screams brought me into a degree of peace that was wholly lacking in my life. I was in the middle of a fantastic death scenario when Colin brought me tumbling back to reality. Hey, shit stain, he said. Saw your dad at Walmart again. He waved to me and I popped in the bird. <laughs> what do you think about that? I tried to ignore him. I hated Colin so much, but I hated my father more for providing Colin with all this degrading ammunition. I was on the cusp of finishing high school when my father passed away. In the weeks prior to his death, I was so overcome with resentment that we barely spoke. Despite sharing a house with him, I would avoid eye contact and pretend he was a piece of furniture. And on the few occasions we did speak, he did his best to insinuate into the conversation my future as a Walmart greeter. Invariably, this would piss me off, and I would return to mentally erasing him from my reality. Then came the heart attack, and the time we'd left together was counted in days. When I came to the hospital to visit him, I knew that it might be the last time we would ever speak. I was afraid he was going to bring up the job again and that I would overreact. I did not want our last words together to be an argument. I trembled as I entered his hospital room. I saw that he was awake and he tried sitting up, but the effort was far too great. He settled back down heavily. I came closer and sat down beside him. He wheezed as he struggled to speak. I'm sorry, son. I know your life hasn't been easy, and I know a lot of that blame falls on my shoulders. He started coughing as his whole body convulsed. He continued. I fell back on telling you the secrets of my job. I know that you feel like I've been deceiving you, that for your whole life I've been defending a dead-end garbage job. I felt my blood rush, and I pursed my lips. He saw that I was becoming furious, and with that last bit of energy, he raised his hand. I understand your rage, your fury. I just want you to know that despite withholding information, I have never deceived you. The job is truly the key to unlocking your dreams. That was too much. I couldn't stand it anymore. Even now, on his deathbed, he continued to reiterate the same bullshit. Without another word, I stormed out of the room. That was the last time I spoke with him. Later that day, he was struck by a second heart attack, the one that ended his life. Now, without my father, I was alone. When I turned 18 a few months later, I felt lost. I had long taken for granted all the wonderful things my father did for me. He bought and prepared all of our meals and provided a roof over my head. Most of all, he loved me, and despite my adolescent belligerence, I loved him too. I missed him dearly. And I regretted being such an unrepentant shithead. 
with my father gone, I was on my own, without a life preserver. It was time to enter the workforce, but all I had was my high school diploma. There weren't a lot of options out there for people without a degree. Even dishwashing and landscaping require references and two years minimum experience. I handed out my resume to dozens of businesses without a single callback. After my father's death, I had time to reflect on his life, and soon I developed a degree of empathy that was absent while he was alive. I realized in hindsight how rough his life truly was. He was a single parent raising a kid with a minimum wage job. He was trapped in a less than ideal career that was kept for my sake to keep me fed with a roof over my head. And I was less than ungrateful and I shunned him for his sacrifice. It wasn't his fault I was teased at school. It was Collins. Maybe I should have stood it to the bullies instead of passively enduring their blows. I was a coward and always ready to blame my father for my failings. I was pondering my situation when I got a phone call. Hey, is this Maury's kid? You want a job? It was one of my dad's co-workers. I recognized his voice as the bearded man from the funeral. I'd spent much of my life digging in my heels, actively rejecting the idea, and yet I was desperate. I needed a job, or soon I would be homeless. A part of me thought maybe if I took this job, I could make amends to my father for the way I treated him. So I put aside years of loathing to become a Walmart greeter. On my first day, they gave me a name tag and a used uniform that smelled like new sweats and old milk. I was brought into a claustrophobic office and was forced to watch a dull training video. I felt like the narrator was talking down to me. Be polite to the customers, always smile, and try to make a non-hostile amount of eye contact. My new supervisor brought me to the staff room. He said he was giving me my father's old locker. I saw the name Mori still taped into the old combination lock. Inside it was empty, except for a jet black Tyrannosaurus Rex. I didn't cry, but I wanted to. Then I was ushered toward the front automatic doors to finally commence my career as a Walmart greeter. You know what? It was exactly how I thought it would be. I smiled and nodded at hundreds of disinterested people. There were no surprises. This is it? I wondered to myself. It was easy money, albeit extremely boring. Initially, I thought it wasn't so bad. But then, Wally came in. Hey, look who it is. It's fucking Wally Walmart. Like father, like son. Man, you're just as pathetic as your old man. I have never been so instantly furious in my entire life. I wanted to strike him down with a volley of blows and stab him in the face with a dull steak knife. <sighs> Instead, I did what the training video said. I smiled and nodded. He laughed and said, <laughs> Hang in there, numb nuts. You got a lifetime of smiling and nodding ahead of you. <laughs> oh man, this is fantastic. I was worried that after graduation I'd never see you again. Now I can visit you every day. I can tell everyone that Wally Walmart has a job at Walmart. He grabbed a hand card and I heard him cackling as he disappeared into the bowels of the store. <sighs> By the end of the day, I was a wreck. All my suspicions were confirmed. The job sucked. There was nothing magical about it. My dreams were not coming true. Part of me still hoped that maybe my dad was right. Maybe there was some aspect of this job that was extraordinary, but... Then Colin's shit-eating grin intruded, and I felt nothing but shame. I was about to head home when one of the other greeters stopped me. Hey, where are you going? You're going to miss the staff meeting. It was the bearded man. What? 
Okay, uh, yeah, sure. I said. I was seriously contemplating not showing up the next day, but I was too fatigued to offer any resistance when he gave me a nudge outside. In the parking lot, we found a lineup of a dozen people in Walmart vests climbing into an old school bus. The bearded man hollered. Hey everyone, this is Mari's kid. Everyone's eyes lit up. One of the greeters said, You're in for a hell of a night, son. And another one said, We sure miss your father, but don't worry, you'll see him again soon. I didn't know what that meant. I was confused and tired and offered no resistance to being ushered onto the bus. As the bus drove us further out of town, my curiosity began to grow. I wondered where we were going and why everyone was so excited. Moreover, why wasn't the staff meeting at the back of the Walmart in the clearly marked staff room? Soon the bus turned on into a winding dirt road that skirted around a dense forest. I asked the person sitting beside me, What are we doing here? They laughed and said, <laughs> We're going to go make our dreams come true. I didn't push further. I felt nervousness flutter inside my chest. Soon we neared a large gate that swung open, allowing the bus to enter. We traveled through a dense corridor of foliage. Finally, the bus stopped and everyone poured out. I hesitantly stepped out of the bus and scanned my surroundings. I was surprised to find that we were in the middle of an open meadow with no buildings to be seen, just an impenetrable wall of trees. About a hundred feet away from the bus, at the centermost point of the meadow, was a minivan-sized hunk of volcanic rock. Everyone walked toward it, and not wanting to be left behind, I followed. As I drew closer, the stone seemed to emit ever so slightly a dull neon green glow. The distinct smell of ozone filled the air. The bearded man saw my confusion and broke off from the group. What are we doing here? I asked. He gave me a hearty pat on the back and said, Your dad would be so proud to see you here. Watch this. He pointed toward an older gentleman who I recognized as one of the other greeters. His eyes were tightly closed and he wore a huge grin on his face as he approached the rock. Loudly I heard a snap and the old man stumbled backwards. He stood back and brushed himself off. He opened his eyes and shouted, Supper time! The bearded man tapped me on the shoulder and said, Look behind you. I turned around and I felt my grip on reality unhinge for a moment. Where before there was nothing but grass was a spectacular dining room table decked out with the finest spread of food I'd ever seen. There were half a dozen scrumptious multi-tiered cakes, a steaming plate of duck a l'orange, and enough lobster to feed a platoon. How the hell did that happen? I gasped. Once again the bearded man pointed at another co-worker. This time it was a woman. She wore the same overjoyed look on her face with her eyes squeezed shut. The same procedure repeated. When she touched the rock, there was a loud snap, and she fell backward. Then, seemingly out of nowhere, an older gentleman appeared. I didn't recognize him as a co-worker, and he was not with the original group. When she saw him, her eyes lit up like a Christmas tree. Oh, Stanley, it's so good to see you! They rushed toward each other and held each other in a long embrace. Then... From an unseen speaker, music began to play. The pair immediately took this cue to start ballroom dancing. The bearded man turned to me and said, Your turn. Uh, my, my turn? I stammered, but what do I do? Just close your eyes and approach the rock, the bearded man said. And your dreams will come true. My mind did not want to process what was occurring around me. The logical part of my brain kept shouting that this was all some elaborate ruse or maybe some misguided hazing ritual enacted to put the new guy in his place, but then the irrational part of me reminded that my father repeated over and over again that the job would make my dreams come true. Curiosity got the better of me, so I walked up to the rock and cautiously reached out my hand. 
felt the hairs on the back of my arm suddenly go erect and a disorienting feeling of vertigo washed over me. The smell of ozone became overwhelming, almost choking. My fingertips finally made contact with the rock. I felt a sudden static shock and stumbled backward. What happened? I tried to say, but my mouth couldn't properly form the words. Instead, I delivered a strange, bestial honk. My entire body felt wrong, like all the proportions I'd grown used to had at once shifted out of place. The bearded man grinned at me and said, Turn around. I obeyed, and behind me was a large mirror. I looked at my reflection and gasped. <laughs> I transformed into a velociraptor. I had to be at least two meters long from snout to tail and two meters tall. I held up my hands and found that my fingers had been replaced by terrifying three-inch claws. I did not resemble the tiny, real-life feathered velociraptors known to paleontology. Instead, I was the artificial beast that existed solely in the movie Jurassic Park. What the hell is happening to me? I shouted. Surrounding me was a ring of Walmart greeters, all beaming with joy. I panicked. I needed to get out of there, now. I broke away from the crowd and took off down to the same road the bus came in on. Beside me, the trees rushed by in a dark green blur. I couldn't believe the speed as I rushed toward the front gate. My path was blocked and there was no way around, so I backpedaled, increased my speed, and jumped right over the gate. Once more, I was back on the road. I didn't know where else to go but back home, so I headed in that direction. Even though it was getting darker, I was confident I knew the way. Now, on the open road, I sprinted as fast as a car. I was terrified, and I felt my heart machine gun in my chest. However, the more I ran, the more amazing I felt. This experience was really something else. Something extraordinary. Something I could only dream about. Then, like a flashbang, a message thrusted itself into my brain. Feed me. I stopped and skidded to a halt. What the hell was that, I wondered. I began running forward when once again the intrusive thought struck me like a seizure. Feed me. I continued running now, but I no longer felt the urge to go home. Instead, overwhelmingly, some internal drive compelled me to make a detour to Colin's house. As soon as I was in the alley that ran adjacent to Colin's home, I hid myself in a row of hedges and peered into his backyard. I heard barking and found him playing with his dog. I stuck my long, scaly snout out of the bushes. Suddenly, the dog looked in my direction and froze. An angry snarl followed. Colin bent over to pat his dog. What is it, bud? Slowly, the remainder of my massive bulk emerged from the bushes. What the fuck? Colin shouted as he jumped into the air, falling hard onto his ass. I inched closer and closer to his prone and panicked form. I was going to enjoy this. I raised my weaponized claws and saw terror blink at Colin's face. It was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen in my life. And then I tore him to shreds as his dog barked helplessly. I realized I was covered in head to claw in Colin's blood. Bringing all this gore home would be a terrible idea, so I ran back to the woods, found the gate, and once more leapt over it and made towards the rock. For years, I dreamed of all the horrible things I would do to Colin. I should have felt ashamed for what I'd done, but I didn't. The intrusive message of feed me was gone. Now, I felt an overwhelming sensation of pleasure and satiety. As I approached the rock, I was greeted by a round of applause. You did it, the bearded man shouted. The rock is satisfied and will not need to feed for a few more years. He patted me on my long lizard back. You've got a promising career as a Walmart greeter. Previously, that thought would have sent me into an 
apoplectic rage, but now everything was different. Now I felt pride. The bearded man had one thing to say. There is someone here to see you. I looked behind and saw him towering over us, a life-sized jet black Tyrannosaurus Rex wearing a gigantic blue Walmart vest. Dad? Is that you? Just remember, I always really did love you. It doesn't look like much. A metal rectangle, larger than a credit card, but smaller than the kind of index cards we'd use in school. It might have been made of copper. It had that reddish gold look to it, but I couldn't say for sure. The metal had a dull glow. Not like it had been polished, but like something deeper in caught the light and held onto it a little. It should have made the words etched onto the card harder to read, but it did the opposite. The thin, precise lines of each letter jumped out at you, catching your eye even if you weren't trying to read them. That's how, when I saw the card for the first time, I knew what was written there, even though it sat on a table five feet away and was turned so the letters were all upside down. Drowning. My father's hand covered the card a moment later, but it was too late. I looked up at him questioningly. I'd been staying with him for less than a week after nearly ten years of not seeing him at all. He was wealthy, and he'd always made sure my mother and I had what we needed financially, but when they separated, it seemed he was gone from our lives for good, and the only sign that he was still alive came in his messy, freshly inked signature at the bottom of every check. When my mother died six weeks earlier, he had one of his lawyers reach out to me. Ask me what I needed, and if I'd be interested in meeting my father and spending time with him. I almost refused. But something wouldn't let me. Maybe it was fear of losing out financial support. It was only three months from graduating college, and I'd start receiving my own checks from him the month I turned 18. Yeah, I'm sure some of it was the money, but it wasn't all of it. It was also the fact that I was alone now, and if I turned away a chance to meet my father and come to know him as an adult, I'd be turning away from the only family I had left. He was older than I'd remembered, but he seemed in good health and was excited to have me visit, telling me that I was welcome to stay as long as I like and come back whenever I wanted. Initially, I had only planned on staying over the weekend, but the longer we were together, the more I realized I wasn't quite ready to go back to my old life yet. I still had a few more days before classes started back, and I felt like I'd only begun to scratch the surface of who my father actually was. He was a good person. Or, he seemed that way. He didn't have to go into work very often, and the times he dealt with someone over the phone or video call, he always seemed pleasant and kind. And he talked with me candidly about his regrets in life, including how he'd removed himself from our lives years before. He told me it had been because he knew he wasn't made of the right stuff to be a good husband or father, and it seemed better at the time to just make sure we were financially secure without inflicting himself on us on a more personal level. When I asked him what that meant, he just shrugged, telling me that he knew it was too late to be a husband to my mother or a father to me. But maybe he could at least be a good friend. And then he hugged me, thanking me for coming and staying with him, and in that moment, I could tell he was just as lonely as me. When he covered the metal card with his hand and slid it into his lap, my first thought wasn't that he was being secretive, but that he was joking with me or being silly. I asked him what he had there, and for a moment, I could see he didn't want to answer at all, or perhaps he wanted to lie to me instead. Swallowing, he shook his head. That's nothing for you to worry about. 
I frowned at him. It said drowning, didn't it? Is everything okay? Forcing a smile, he nodded. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it's, it's, it's fine. Everything's okay. I didn't believe him, but our new relationship was, well, very new, and I didn't want to push my father away by prying into his private business. And if the twisting in my stomach told me it was something instead of nothing, well, I needed to be patient. I could always ask again once we'd had time to grow closer. Except we didn't have that time, because three days later, my father had drowned. Everyone agreed it was a terrible accident, though it also seemed very strange. I'd just left the morning before, and he was still at his house deep in the middle of 200 wooden acres when he apparently fell into a two-inch mud puddle back behind the house. He had the land cleared to put in a greenhouse that summer, and the recent rains had turned the soft dirt and clay into a soggy chain of islands partially submerged in the remnants of the afternoon showers. Even that next morning, the morning of my father's death, the ground was pockmarked with puddles. Apparently, he slipped and fell into one, and somehow, despite my father's good health and strength, he was unable to pull himself free from the water before he slipped away. They questioned me and other people who had been at the house, of course, but there were no signs of foul play. When I called the attorney who reached out to me originally, I was told that the autopsy showed no sign of anything other than death by drowning. When I asked if my father had any enemies, he just chuckled softly and said that he'd be in touch. Three weeks later, I was in the lawyer's office. His assistant offered me coffee or water before leaving us alone. The man across the desk from me was in his 50s, probably a few years younger than my father had been, and the expression on his face was that of someone settling down to eat an unpleasant meal. <sighs> There's no easy way to tell you this. Death is an unpleasant subject, and the things that come along with it, well, it comes with the territory of my work, but it doesn't mean it's easier. And I also don't want you to think that this was easy for your father. He was a very private man, but he always was fair with me. And I think he was always honest, too. And when he told me that he was proud of you, that he loved you, I believed him. He stared at me then as though he expected a response, and while I was on the verge of tearing up at his words, I wasn't sure what I could say. When he continued to watch me silently, I just asked him to go ahead with whatever he wanted or needed to tell me. He nodded. Well, the first thing is, your father was not entirely honest with you. In the years after he left you and your mother, he had another family. A wife and two children, as a matter of fact. I stared at him, my sadness beginning to curdle in anger. What? So, all that stuff he said about leaving us because he knew he wasn't right for a family was just bullshit? The man shrugged. I can't speak to that. Like I said, your father was a private man, and while I knew of his other family, of course, I don't know what his motivations were for lying to you before and instructing me to tell you the truth after his death. I sniffled. <laughs> because he was a fucking coward. Or he was. Maybe. I don't know. But there is more if you care to hear it. Waving my hand, I... Wiped at my eyes with my forearm. <laughs> sure, whatever. Well, while he left the majority of his estate to his wife and other children, he did establish a trust for you in the amount of $2 million, with payments to be sent to you in increasing amounts over the next 10 years, at which time the remainder will be yours to do with as you will. He also left you this. I looked up as he was sliding a sealed tan envelope across the desk to me. What is it? I don't know. It only had instructions to leave it sealed and give it to you. If you'd like to open it here, I can set you up in one of our conference rooms for your privacy. 
I picked up the envelope and felt something shift inside. There was paper in there, but there was something else, too. Something small, thin, and hard. Glancing at the attorney, I nodded. Uh, yeah, if you don't mind. <laughs> Not at all. He led me out of his office and down the hall to a larger room with a long table surrounded by high-backed chairs. Gesturing for me to go in, he had stepped back out and was moving to close the door when he hesitated. You know, you must have had quite the impression on the last days of his life. I looked at him confused. Why do you say that? He gave me an awkward smile. Well, the trust, the envelope, all of this. He sent all that up two days before he died. Like I said, I think he loved you very much. With that said, he closed the door. My body felt heavy as I sat down. All this happened so quickly. Finding him, starting to know and love him again, only to lose him, and then all of this? Lies and money and weird envelopes filled with... What? Sucking in a breath, I opened the envelope and dumped its contents out onto the polished wood of the conference table. There were two pages of folded stationery, and beside them, the copper card I'd seen my father hide from me. Even in the soft, recessed lighting of the conference room, the engraved letters seemed to glow out at me from the reddish skin of the thing. Drowning. I wasn't surprised by the card being there. Not really. Hadn't there been a dozen times when I thought about telling someone what I'd seen? Asked the cops or the doctors or this lawyer if it was really possible that my father would die of accidental drowning just days after seeing him with a metal card warning of just that. And yet I never had because... Because I knew what they would say. They hadn't seen it themselves. And even if they had, how could a word kill a man? I felt myself asking that same question as I unfolded the last words my father had for me and began to read. I should start by saying I'm sorry, but that would sound cheap and hollow, wouldn't it? If I was that sorry, I wouldn't have done the things I've done. I wouldn't have abandoned you, lied to you, put you in this position. I can try to pretend that the money I'm leaving you, the chance for a life I'm giving you, is some step toward making things right, but that's dishonest, too. The truth is, or at least part of the truth is, I'm too big a coward to end this myself. The other part, and I'm being honest here, is that I truly am proud of you and love you. I didn't realize that, any of that, when... I had you contacted and brought to the country house. I wanted to meet you, had to meet you, for it needed to work, but I had no idea I would like you so much. I had no idea it would be so hard to kill you even if it meant saving myself. I need to explain both so you know what you're facing and so you don't think I'm so insane, though it might be a tall order given what I'm about to tell you. Still, I have to try, if only for you to have the best shot of beating it, or at least know what your options are. I'm a very wealthy man. Some would consider me a very powerful man as well. But as with everything, the wealth and power comes with sacrifices. I've done things I'm not proud of, and I've made enemies along the way. Most of them can't touch me. Wealth can insulate you from most things if you have a brain. But there are some. The metal card enclosed with this letter is called a funerary. It is, uh, for lack of a better or specific term, a cursed object. 
Despite several years and much expense and effort, I still don't know exactly who put it on me. I only know what I do about it as a consequence of the same money and energy. When I first found it laying next to me on the pillow, I didn't know what it was. A debit card or a pass key, perhaps. And then it began to change in my hand. As I watched... Amazed, letters formed onto its surface. Drowning. At the time, I had no clue what that meant. But as I learned about funeraries, it became all too clear. Initially, the funerary is like a death omen. When you first touch it, or it is bound to you, it will tell you the manner in which you will die. Not where or when, or who else might be involved. Just how. And for days, or months, or years, it will just stay like that. You can try to throw it away, but it will find its way back to you. If you melt it, or destroy it, same thing. Always just that small detail of your death and nothing else taunting you and filling you with dread. Mine was like that for over four years. It's funny, you know. My father, your grandfather, used to joke about death. He'd say that he has seen exactly zero proof that he'd ever die until he did. He wasn't inclined to believe it. Now everyone knows intellectually that they're going to die, but to have some proof. Not the concept or the hypothetical inevitability of it, but actual proof of how you're going to go. Dread can be like gravity. It pulls on you. And the closer it drags you, the more the weight of it starts to buckle your bones and twist you out of shape. It doesn't take long before you don't recognize yourself anymore. I don't think that I'd always been willing to sacrifice someone else to stay alive, but by the time the other side of the card came to life, I already knew what it meant and was eager for a chance to put some innocent lamb's blood on my door even if it was you. When your death is growing close, the other side of the card will change. It will just be a name. And I guess if you don't know what it means, it does you very little good. Maybe that's part of the trick of the curse. If you don't understand what it's asking for, you can't escape it. But I understood. I had the resources to find out what it was, and what it did. So when I had the image of the card suddenly burning in my mind, I quickly pulled it from my safe and examined it. As I watched, the blank back of the card spelled out your name. The funerary only tells a name for one purpose, so that the cursed can offer that person's life in exchange for their own. If they want to avoid their death omen, they have to kill the named person with their own hand. Apparently, it's always someone you know or will know soon after. The window of time between the name appearing and the fulfillment of the death omen varies, but it's always within a few months. Time enough for you to decide what you value most. When I walked out to greet you, hug you, and welcome you into my home, I had no question what I was going to do. I already had the sedatives to slip into your food, the drugs to inject, more than enough heroin to kill you quickly and humanely in your sleep. When I called the police, no one would think any more that my estranged daughter apparently had a drug problem, that she'd taken some of my legally prescribed sedatives on top of the illegal drugs she'd brought into my home. That I was the victim in all of this. I didn't like the idea of killing you or lying about you after your death, but it felt necessary to protect me and my family. But, you're my family too. I see myself in you, and I see your mother, who, despite everything, I really did love once upon a time. I found myself stalling, putting off your death every day we spent together, even as I felt mine drawing even closer. I was terrified. I still am. 
but I've come to realize I'm more afraid of hunting you than I am of dying, and so I'll accept what I have in store. And my hope is that you will believe what I'm telling you, and know that I mean it to help you. And in that knowledge, forgive me a little for this last. Because the funerary isn't just a curse of the person. It's a curse of the bloodline. It either stops when everyone in that family is dead, or someone has sacrificed another in their place. I can select who in my family gets it on my death, but if I don't choose, it's random until everyone is gone or an outsider is sacrificed. I could tell you that I picked you because you're the oldest of my children and it would become your first anyway, but that'd be a lie. It could have come just as easily for my wife or other children, and while I do love you, I have to admit I love them more. So please, for the sake of you, so please, for your sake and theirs, do the smart thing, the hard thing. When he gives you a name, you kill them in your place. By my blood do I find you. By my will do I blind you. Offer yourself to another. The price must be paid and the covenant kept. So as it was, and so as it will ever be. Salah. When I put down the letter, with trembling hands I could already feel the change. Not just in the atmosphere, but in me. As leaden as I had felt before, there was a new weight and pressure on me now. Looking over at the metal card, the funerary, I saw that the word etched across its skin had changed. Burning. I guess I was lucky. I had ten years. Ten years of living my life, of learning to deal with the dread and lying to myself that my father had been wrong. I tried to get rid of it, of course, to destroy it, but it always came back. And after a while, I just felt grateful that a name hadn't appeared on the other side yet. And then I met you. And well, I fell for you right away. The last six years have been the best of my life, and I can't imagine what life would be like without you. <laughs> but that's the thing, isn't it? There's so much we can't imagine. I could never imagine curses being real, or having to hurt or kill another person just to live. And the idea of hurting you? I don't even know how to even start thinking about that in terms I can understand. I also can't imagine death, or dying, or what comes after. The idea of an afterlife, I don't understand, or nothing at all. It, it terrifies me. And my inability to even think about it, to truly imagine not existing or living as I am for as long as I can, there's a... There's a purity in that fear, to that dread that transcends even our love. Like my father said, dread is like gravity. And perhaps it has twisted me into something terrible, I don't know. What I do know is that I have to be free of the crushing weight of it. Even if it means losing you. That's why I have you in that box. It's all rigged up properly. I paid someone quite a bit of money to make sure it was done right. When this recording stops, the box will fill with gas, and you'll just relax and go to sleep until it's over. And before you ask, yes, I am the one that turned it all on. It has to be my own hand, as horrible as that is. But don't worry. We'll all be over soon. And I'm sorry, even if my father would say such an apology is hypothetical in a situation like this. Just remember, I always really did love you. I just love myself more.
My heart was already racing when I sat down in the passenger seat of the filthy and foul-smelling land yacht of an ancient Cadillac. The large man who was to be my chauffeur for the night barely spoke a word as we sped from one downtown city road to the next, but I was glad of that fact. What he had in store for me before the sun should rise again, I had no real way of knowing. But I was certain it would be nothing good. I used to love reading stories, but as much as I enjoyed indulging in the good ones, I couldn't resist picking apart those I didn't care for. I would rarely comment on the tales I enjoyed, but the ones that didn't do it for me, well, I wouldn't hold back. I made sure to point out every single little typo or error I could find while making sure the author knew how much they let me down as a reader. They say to write for an audience of one, and as far as I was concerned, I was the lone reader who was meant to be appeased by the writer. For the most part, I wouldn't get any replies to my scathing reviews, but when I did, it would almost annoy me when it was a pleasant rebuttal. Things like, I'm sorry this didn't work for you, perhaps next time, or I know my work isn't for everyone, but thanks for taking the time to read it. I'm not going to say I was looking for a fight or anything, but friendly replies to my likely hurtful words felt almost like I was being casually dismissed. That still wouldn't stop me from letting my footnotes fly whenever I came across something not to my liking, but I couldn't have known what it would lead to. I don't imagine anyone could predict anything like this, but I wish I'd realized how much my words could hurt me, even if I didn't care how much they offended others. The writer's name was Viatorvius, and I'd left comments on just about every story he posted. In all honesty, his tales weren't all that bad. A little too graphic and gruesome for my liking, but enjoyable for what they were. They all featured the same narrator. Same creature pretending to be a man while inflicting its own brand of brutal justice on those it deemed deserving of its wrath. Basic guilty pleasure stuff but sometimes entertaining and worth a read. It was the typos and grammatical errors that drove me nuts, as well as his inability to use punctuation the right way. Now, I can't lie, I'm not the best with punctuation myself, plus I tend to have some regular spelling flubs too, but that never stopped me from bringing it up. This isn't about my own hypocrisy, or otherwise lack of tact in the way I critique, though... It most certainly changed my outlook on all of that. I had a pretty rough day when I came across his most recent story. I was in an awful mood. Not exactly after reading some gory fiction, but I did anyway. It was so damn long-winded, filled with gratuitous violence and swearing, and just all-around painful to read at the time. I did finish it, though. Plus, I even found myself on the edge of my seat a time or two, but in all, it wasn't my cup of tea. Not the kind I'd like to drink when I was in this sort of mood, anyway. Being the most important of all his respective readers, I tore it to shreds. Don't get me started on the steaming pile of illiterate garbage. Verbose, drawn-out slog to read through, filled to the brim with unnecessary and juvenile swearing, and all-around insulting to anyone with a modicum of intelligence. The author likely lives in his parents' basement, listens to heavy metal music, and has never had any sort of meaningful relationship with anyone other than his pillow. You should be ashamed of yourself for this, and I feel dumber for having read it. Was it necessary to outright insult the guy? Of course not, but that didn't stop me. Did I genuinely think the story was that god-awful? Not at all. Any other day I would have likely enjoyed it, let a few mildly scathing remarks, and went on with my day. Between not sleeping much the night before, and getting treated like an indentured servant by my boss, I used this poor guy as an outlet for my own misery. I wouldn't admit that to myself at the time, but I realize now the error of my ways, even if it is too little, too late. For the next few hours, I kept checking back on my comment to see if it had garnered a response. 
It had frustrated me that all it had gotten was a handful of thumbs down, but not a word from the author. Not a first, anyway. I was still grouchy when I made one last look to see that the writer had indeed left a reply. I almost felt my mouth water after reading his short response. You can do better? Instantly, I felt my face getting warm as though he had the nerve to even ask such an outlandish thing. Of course I can. I could write better than this slog with one arm tied behind my back. I actually had to retype those words a few times as my fingers were trembling so violently that I kept smacking the wrong keys. I just stared at the screen when I was done, waiting for the guy to have the nerve to say another word. When his two-word reply popped up beneath my blunt retort, I was finally lost for words. Sounds good. I still left that screen pulled up on my laptop while I tried to figure out if I should type anything in response, but I couldn't even think of anything to say. Was it some sort of dare? Did he want to challenge me or something? I just gazed at the screen for a few more moments before walking away from it to find something else to occupy my mind. If nothing else, I wasn't angry anymore. Just a bit perplexed. I wasn't entirely sure why, but I couldn't stop thinking about it until I lay down for the night. I'd only been asleep for maybe two hours when the pounding on my front door caused my eyes to blink back to life. I groggily pulled the phone from my nightstand to check on the time, instantly lighting a fire beneath me when the heavy knocking repeated. I threw the blanket off my body, cursing under my breath as I pushed my bedroom door open so hard I cracked the drywall when the knob smacked against it. Do you have any idea what time it is? I said after yanking open my front door with even more aggravation than I had the one that led to my bedroom. How do? The greasy man in the long trench coat asked. <laughs> Pissed off and tired. What do you want? I felt my back tense up when I finally allowed my eyes to raise to meet the face of the hulking man. He was somewhat unusual looking, though I couldn't quite put my finger on what it was about him that made me feel that way. He appeared to be maybe in his mid to late forties, shoulder length, messy and knotted brown hair with light streams of gray, thick beard stubble and a very weathered looking face. His crow's feet had crow's feet, and his cheek appeared almost sunken and perhaps lightly scarred. He looked to have a solid build and stood about a half a foot taller than me. I think it was his clothes that made him appear more out of place. His dark gray trench coat was thick, almost business looking, though worn in places and speckled in a variety of stains. His stripped blue jeans came down to where they tucked into pointed black cowboy boots, which were also in fairly rough shape, with duct tape holding them together in some places. He wore a red and white checkered shirt, unbuttoned halfway down to reveal a black t-shirt with small holes throughout. He had five necklaces, two gold, one silver, and two with brown leather cords. Whatever hung from them I could not see, as they were hidden below where his shirt was buttoned. There was also the dusty bowler hat upon his head, which is something you just don't see that often anymore. Don't suppose I'd come in, could I? His voice sounded either southern or Cajun a bit, worn and graveled, yet strong in its tone. Don't suppose you can, I replied, wrapping my fingers around the door in preparation for slamming it in the stranger's face. Oh, come on now. Don't be like that. He gave me a wide grin, revealing yellow and chipped teeth, except for one golden canine and the other made of silver. Okay, we're done here. Have a good night. As I made to close the door, he quickly pushed past me, swatting the door from my grip. Hey! I belted, instantly stomping after the man who now had his back turned to me. I grabbed his shoulder to spin him around to face me, but he wouldn't budge. Well, it was more like I couldn't budge him. Not even a little. His body didn't even shift. He just turned his head to give me a sideways look with the one eye that faced me, along with a crooked smile. 
You can start some if you want, but you might be better if we could just talk a bit. <sighs> what do you want? I asked, pulling my hand away from his shoulder as my fingers began to tremble. He raised his eyebrows with a tilt of his head, gesturing toward the couch and chairs in the living room. He practically dropped onto the couch, stretching his arms out across the back. I noticed his oversized hands with thick and dirty fingernails that looked as though they could carve into dense wood with little to no effort. He pressed his head against the wall, tilting his bowler hat upwards before settling in to get cozy. I could see an almost muddy smear of where his hat rubbed against the wall, along with trails of dust or dirt that had flaked from his coat onto the tan suede leather couch. My body felt almost numb while I took a seat on the matching recliner to the left of the couch. I could feel my knees attempting to shake, but I could only hope it wasn't overly obvious. I didn't want to let this guy, whoever he was, know that he scared the shit out of me. I can't entirely say why he had me so unnerved. Yes, it felt like I tried to move a giant tree with my bare hands when I attempted to turn him to face me, but I couldn't rationalize that as little more than him being stronger than me. There was something about him that felt, I don't know, ancient, maybe. Don't suppose I could trouble you for something to drink before we get started, could I? Anything in particular? I replied, feeling a certain desire to get on his good side. Before we get started, as it were. Beer, whiskey, rum, whatever you got. I quickly grabbed a six-pack of beer from the kitchen, sat it on the wide coffee table he had sent to place his muddy feet on, and grabbed one for myself, twisting the cap off. He reached for two, picked them up between his fingers, placed them against the lip of the coffee table, and smacked his hand across the tops. Both caps practically flew off as they tore deep chunks from the wood of the table. It was at this point I realized he was trying to get a rise out of me. Whether it was to intimidate me or piss me off, I wasn't sure, but I wasn't about to give him what he wanted either way, even if I did feel my face flush. All right then. He said after placing one beer on the table before chugging down a good half of the one he held. What are we going to do about this? Uh, about what, exactly? He just glared at me, swishing a mouthful of fresh beer around in his mouth. He sat the bottle on the table next to the one that still awaited him, reached into his coat, and pulled out a thick and wrinkled cigar. He lit it with a small wooden match and just stared into my eyes. I hadn't noticed before that his irises were almost shimmering, light purple. It felt as though I were looking into some sort of nebula or cosmic storm as we gazed at each other. No, this man was no human. I did not doubt that. Don't play with me, boy. Though he spoke quite calmly, his words sounded more threatening than if he had screamed to them. This was the first time he had allowed the smile to fade from his lips. He puffed away on his cigar, but he would not break his gaze from mine. I wanted to look away, but it felt like staring down a dog to assert dominance. When I first met him at the door, I thought I could possibly handle myself if the situation got out of hand. The more I shared his company, the more I knew I had been fooling myself before. I wouldn't stand a chance against whatever he was. You think you write better than me. What? I don't even know who... I couldn't convince my lips to keep muttering my words when I realized who it was who sat across from me. Via Torbius? Oh, you remember my name. Ain't that nice? You remember what you said, too, no? My lungs were suddenly struggling to do their job. While my chest felt so tight I thought I may well pass out, I dread to think what this guy would do to me if I lost consciousness in front of him. Not only could I not fathom how he found me, but what were his true motivations for visiting me at two in the morning? Look, man, uh, sir, 
I didn't mean to be so harsh. I, I, I had a, I had a bad day. I mean, your story was really good. I just don't go groveling, boy. You said what you said, and that ain't no small thing. I'm sorry. So sorry, sir. I didn't mean to. Ain't that part what brung me here, Ken? It was the other. He raised his eyebrows, smiled wide, and winked when he said that, making me feel strangely more on edge than I already did. I can't lie, this guy had me terrified. Not only did it look like one scratch of those gnarly fingernails would likely give me Ebola or something, but he looked like he could effortlessly tear me in two if he had the urge to. He almost appeared more like a beast than a man. There was something almost feral about him, something hungry. The, the, the other part? You said you could do better, you remember? I, 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 I didn't mean to, sir. I was rude and cold and just a complete asshole. I swear, ain't nothing get worked up for, boy. But you gonna go for a ride with me. When you get back, you gonna write about what you seen, you hear me? I just nodded. Or I, I think I did, anyway. My whole body was shivering, so it could very well have just been my trembling making me a life-size bobblehead doll. He lifted himself from the couch, leaving a large, man-sized imprint of grime and dust in his wake. As he casually strolled over to the front door, he wrapped his fingers around the knob, looking back at me before pulling it open. If you're good, I might even let you keep your both hands. Type it out. Ain't no need in tearing one off if I don't got to. Those words almost caused me to lose control of my bladder. Even though I had offered to write a better tale than his with one hand tied behind my back, he obviously had no interest in using a rope to bind me. I had no idea where he intended to take me, nor what the story I was expected to write would entail, but I could only hope it would qualify for whatever he considered good. For a solid hour... He guided his massive car up and down parts of the city I'd never seen before. I couldn't tell if he was looking for something specific, but I was growing more nervous by the second. With the type of storytelling he specialized in, I could only hope his work was mostly fabricated, horrific fantasy, but I would soon observe firsthand that that was not the case at all. He finally parked the ancient caddy across the street from an especially dingy-looking motel. It came off like one of those places you could rent a room by the hour or maybe a glorified crack den or something. He tilted his head, gesturing me to follow along when he lifted himself from the car. As we walked into the lobby of the inn, I could see that my first instinct about the place had been quite accurate. It looked as though it should be condemned. Every wall was riddled with holes, filth, and varying sizes of creepy crawlies darting one way or another. There were at least three somewhat malnourished-looking people, two men and a young woman, passed out in the small room. Again, my guide gestured with his head toward the stairs, where we passed by two more passed out, possibly dead young adults. It looked as though they hadn't bathed in weeks, but they didn't do so much as twitch while we weaved around them. After climbing about three floors worth of steps, navigating down and across a few short hallways, each lined with more individuals in various stages of chemically induced bliss, the big guy pushed open a door to one of the rooms. It was distinctly different from the rest of what I'd seen. Brightly lit, well furnished, and actually smelled quite nice. It was about three times the size of the lobby, and held about ten or so perfectly healthy-looking and fully sober men, along with four women who I couldn't help but assume to be working girls. I don't mean to sound presumptuous or anything, but the women were all dressed quite scantily while they fawned over the well-dressed men. Again, not to make assumptions, but everything about these guys reads like mob enforcers or otherwise less-than-legally-inclined individuals. 
The two slender, older men toward the rear of the room, counting and arranging stacks of cash, didn't exactly make me think I was judging too harshly either. While I followed my guide across the room toward the few important-looking men sharing a couch with one of the girls, each head turned to face us as we walked by. When we got close to where the guy who I would guess to be the boss sat, I noticed that some of the things we'd strolled past had closed the gap between us. As we neared the man on the classy love seat, another guy, a little bigger than my guy, got in his face. You don't belong here. Turn around. Forget what you've seen here. You'll be... His words were silenced quickly when the big guy quickly butted his head against that of the bodyguard. That one hit knocked him out cold, inspiring the others in the room to move in closer. How do? My guide asked, tipping his dusty bowler hat at the distinguished-looking older man in the neatly pressed suit. Do I know you? The man asked, waving his hand toward those who now walked up beside us. I was growing more terrified by the second. At first, my only concern was that my taxi driver for the night was planning to leave me bleeding in a ditch somewhere, but now I had no doubt I was about to get plugged by a couple professionals. In all honesty, I could have worded that a lot better, but how often does one get a chance to say something like that? No, sir, I can't say that you does, but I certainly would appreciate you hearing me out. The big guy pulled off his bowler hat, trailing a slender cloud of dust behind it. He seemed to be showing a good deal of respect for the older guy, but I had to believe the two beside us and the three to our rear with their guns drawn were a factor in that. They were most definitely the major influence on my heart attempting to beat free from my chest. While I was shaking like a leaf in a tornado, my guide looked as composed as if he was just shopping for hot dog buns. Go ahead then. Don't waste my time. Much obliged, he said, placing the hat back on his head. All I ask is if y'all be willing to move your little operation somewhere else. This used to be such a nice little old place till you and your peoples moved in. He spoke so light and carefree as though he was simply asking to borrow a cup of sugar. The older guy leaned forward, shaking the young girl off his shoulder to gaze into the eyes of the large man who looked down on him. Without warning, the man on the couch began to laugh so hard that he almost started to choke. The goons to our sides and backs let out awkward chuckles, seemingly feeling inspired to join in whether they found the situation funny or not. I asked you nicely, the big guy said, allowing even the glimmer of respect to fade from his voice. Won't ask again. Who the hell do you think you are? The older man asked, still laughing between his words. Just a concerned citizen, but you haven't had a bad influence on this street here. Can't allow it to go on no more. And what exactly can you do to... He moved so quickly that neither I nor the goon squad had a chance to react. In one swift motion, he whipped the old man from his comfy spot on the couch by the throat, spinning to face me and the ones who raised their gun the second he turned around. They couldn't even steady their aim by the time he held their boss in front of them, gripping his neck so tightly that it looked as though his head would pop right off at any minute now. Got your attention now, don't I? The now visibly trembling, borderline senior citizen attempted to speak, but couldn't seem to muster enough oxygen up to even make anything more than a wheezing moan. Everyone else in the room, aside from the girls who were running for the door, had their firearms trained on the big guy while I slowly descended to the floor. So y'all gonna be vacating the premises where I gotta evict you right here and now. The man finally managed to force one single word to breach his lips, though it was not the best choice in my opinion. I may have been a little more than a terrified observer in this madness, but even I knew he made the wrong decision. Fire! The two men had crept up behind where the big guy stood and unleashed a barrage of bullets into his back. I curled up into as tiny a ball as my body could form, but I still winced at the sound of the lead tearing into the meat of my chauffeur. When the echoing gunfire fell silent, I allowed myself to glare up to see what was left of him. 
To my surprise, he still stood in place, having turned the old man to face him while giving him an expression a parent would give to a misbehaving child. That not angry, just disappointed look. He still glared at him with that condescending stare while he tightened the grip of the hand around the necklace he held. I could hear the bones crunching while the face reddened and swelled. As the large hand closed tight into a fist, his eyes protruded from the balloon that was once a heavily wrinkled face before the head flipped over sideways with one final loud crack. Whether the room's occupants were so stunned by what they just witnessed or were putting together a plan to escape with their own necks intact, I had no idea. They all just continued to stare at the big guy when he dropped their former employee to the floor. As soon as the old man flopped lifelessly onto the hard floor across me, every gun in the room unleashed. I skidded my body across the floor, hoping to stay out of the path of the swarm of bullets, ripping the room apart, finally making it to a large table by the left wall. I couldn't make out any more than a blurry shape as the big guy darted from one of his attackers to the next. I saw him briefly when he stopped for long enough to tear through one throat before moving on to the next. One by one, the well-dressed goons hit the ground, each gushing bodily fluids from deep and grizzled gashes across their chest, faces, and necks. I watched on as the crowd thinned, giving my guide a chance to take his time a little more no longer making quick work of the poor bastards. Of the three that remained, he wrapped his large right hand across the top of the first one's head, charging toward the next in line, still dragging the man by his scalp. When he reached his next victim, he snatched them up by the head too, only pausing for a second to allow them both the scream at the top of their lungs. When he slowly pushed their heads together, he twisted his wrists from side to side as he mashed their flesh until the skull split, forcing jagged shards of bone to come through one face and into the other. Even after the horrifying shrieks fell silent, he continued to smear them into one almost flattened, meaty and grotesque fleshy pancake. The last man had already run for the door by the time his associates fell to the floor, still glued together by sticky gore. The big guy didn't storm after him, just idly walked toward him, pulling another cigar from inside of his long coat. I was pressing my back so hard against the wall, I almost felt like I would shatter my spine against the wood like two skulls being smashed together. I was sure that he was about to squeeze or shred me apart, just as he had everyone else in the room, but he just stood in place when he got to the table I was hiding beneath while still trying to push through the wall beside it. Ain't gonna hurt you, kid, he said calmly, lighting a cigar. He held out his blood-soaked hand as though he meant for me to grab it, but the sight of it just made me squeak out of a startled yelp. The shit, he said, wiping his hand back and forth on his pants. My bad. Wasn't thinking. Once his crimson-stained mitt was at least somewhat dry, he held it out to me once more. I can't say I wasn't scared, but I thought resisting his offer would just add to the insult that led to our meeting in the first place. I raised my shuddering hand to grab his before he effortlessly pulled me up from under the table, holding me out in front of him by the hand and dropping me to my shaky feet. Thank, thank you, I said, my muscles spasming with fear. You remember the way back out? Uh, I think so. Meet you at the car. Gotta catch me astray. With that, he turned on his heels and sped through the door and was out of sight within seconds. I just stood there, frozen for a minute, darting my eyes around the room while fighting against the lump in my throat from the mess of carnage before me. When I finally convinced my limbs to work again, I quickly paced back to the door my guide had fled through only moments before, weaving in between the still unmoving guests of this fine establishment. When a blood-curdling scream bellowed out from floors below, it froze me in my tracks again. Assuming the hunter had indeed found his prey, I began to move once more. My still 
shuddering legs made descending the stairs no simple task, but when I arrived back on the ground floor, it took every ounce of self-control I had not to vomit evidence all over the lobby. When my eyes met the upper half of the man who had hoped to find freedom when he darted from once pleasant room to the otherwise moth-eaten hotel, I chose not to seek out where his bottom half was, only held my breath as I charged toward the fresh air of the world beyond the door. The moment I left that awful place behind me, the chilly breeze almost collided with the burning acid in my stomach in a less than friendly manner. I still fought to maintain my composure, but even when the old caddy on the other side of the road revved its engine one good time, instantly pulling my attention back to the fact that my chaotic night may not just be over yet. Feeling my guts bubbling over, I ran as quickly as I could toward the land yacht, falling to my knees and retching into the breakdown lane before I could even think about stopping it. I was still buckled over, gasping for breath when the passenger door opened up across from me. You alright, kid? I'm good. Thank Thank you, I replied, still dry heaving. When I finally composed myself as much as I could hope to, I climbed into the stretched out Cadillac without a word, clicked my seatbelt buckle, and stared vacantly through the filthy glass. Feeling the eyes of the stranger carving into mine, I turned to see him cocked to one side in his seat, gazing at me with a smirk on his face. When he moved his arm, I winced and tensed up, but he just patted me on the chest with a look of something resembling pride in his face. You done good, kid. With that, he shifted himself back into position, revved the engine one more time, threw it into gear, and got back on the road. Throughout the drive back to my home on the outskirts of the city, my chauffeur happily and loudly sang along to the greatest hits of 70s classic rock. I almost began to feel a little more comfortable and even a bit thankful to still be alive until I took in the grim nature of this gleeful celebratory karaoke. When we pulled back into my driveway, I tensed up again with the fear of the night's festivities having reached their end. He turned the radio volume down and shifted himself to face me again. You got a week to write about what you've seen tonight. I ain't gonna watch over you, leave you with one less hand or nothing, even if that was the deal. He said with a chuckle. But let's just see if you can really put together a better tale than me. And if, if, if I can't? He just gave me a wide grin, revealing those yellow teeth bookmarked with his gold and silver canines. He didn't answer my stuttered question, only leaned over to unlatch the door to my right, causing me to damn near piss myself for a second. It wasn't until I climbed out that he spoke one last time while he shifted back into his driving position. If it ain't no drawn out slog, maybe we can collaborate again sometime. Have us a meaningful relationship. Get me out of my mama's basement and all. He gave a wink before shifting the old caddy into reverse. See you around, kid. One way or the other. I still stood in place, shivering from head to toe while he backed up, cranked his radio back to full blast, and drove out of sight. Even though he gave me a week, I started writing as soon as I got out of my extended shower. The sun was already beginning to rise beyond the glass of my windows, but there was no chance of convincing my frantic thoughts to calm down enough to let me sleep any time soon. Besides, I wanted to make sure I got at least a rough draft down before anything I witnessed that night got otherwise altered or exaggerated by my subconscious. Whichever way this goes, whether he likes my story or not, I'm certain I haven't seen the last of Atropius. But I truly hope he likes this. I tried to revisit his previous post to delete my childish criticism, but he had already taken them down. It could be that he plans on making me his personal scribe if he enjoys my story. Of course, if he doesn't like it, maybe he will write another. One more tale of dark justice featuring me in painfully vivid detail.
I once knew a girl named Jericho. I think I was in love with her, but I was also 17, so maybe I didn't know what love was yet. I know I was excited when she was around, and getting her to laugh or doing something that made her think I was smart or brave, even something small, always made me happier than just about anything else. I know that I still wake up most nights shaking and crying, hearing her screams as they drug her down the hall. We had been hanging out, our version of casually dating, for about six months when we started going for wonder walks. We'd pick a starting point and drive out there and then spend the afternoon or early evening wandering around until we eventually made our way back to the car. More than once we got a bit lost, but that was part of the fun and excitement of it all, and she had a good enough sense of direction that we never stayed off course for long. It was during these walks that we learned more about each other and grew closer, away from other friends and school, our families, and the gravity of a world that wanted to change us and make us bend. On those wonder walks, we could be ourselves, alone and together. And if we fell in love, that's when it happened. The spring of our senior year, I had to go away one weekend to visit the State University's campus. I had no plan on going there. Jericho and I had already decided we were staying local for college in no small part so we could stay together. But my parents had both gone to state, and they wouldn't be satisfied until I at least visited the campus. It was only two days, and at the time it hadn't seemed like a big deal at all. It wasn't until I got back and saw Jerry that I realized something important had happened while I was gone. She was so excited when I got in her car that she looked ready to jump out of her skin. Some of it was being glad to see me, but not all, or even most. No. She was jittery, almost shaking with some kind of spastic joy that was intriguing, but made me more than a little worried, too. When I asked her what was going on, she just laughed and shook her head, told me she'd have to show me for me to believe it, but she'd tell me what was up while I drove. Okay, so I have two big things to tell you, but I'll start with, well, the way weirder one. So yesterday, I was bored, and yeah, I was missing you, okay? So I decided to go for one of our walks. We've been talking about going out to some of the woods west of town, right? I thought this would be a good time to check out that area. If it sucked, we could avoid it down the line. If it was cool, I'd have a neat surprise for you when you got back. So I go, and I just drive around for a little bit. There's not a lot out there once you get past that trailer park on the highway in the landfill. I wound up stopping down at this little rideshare parking lot and walking into the woods from there go for a couple of hours, and I'm heading back through this kind of boggy area without too many trees when I see it. I'm already starting to feel nervous by this point, though I'm not sure why. See what? She gives a brittle laugh, her eyes still fixed on the road. (laughs) It was a hallway. I frowned, confused. Wait, I I think I missed something. Didn't you say you were walking out in the woods? In like a swampy area or something? Yep. Okay, so was there like a house or an abandoned building or something out there? What were you seeing? She shook her head. No, nothing like that. No buildings or anything. Just when I was walking there, I was focused on where I put my feet ground was soft in spots, and I didn't want to step on a water moccasin. But then I noticed my head was itching, and the hairs were standing up on my arms. It was kind of like that feeling of electricity, but different, too. Just, I could feel something was out there, yeah? Jericho turned and met my eyes briefly, and I nodded in confirmation. She looked oddly relieved as she looked back ahead and kept talking. So I started paying more attention to what was around. I didn't see anything at first, so I kept walking. Then suddenly I saw it. My voice sounded small in my own ears when I spoke. What was it? The corner of her mouth twitched slightly. It was a hallway, like I said. A long hallway that was dark, but I could still see down it somehow. It seemed like it went on forever. Swallowing, I gave a laugh I didn't feel. 
<laughs> Sounds like you uh, fell asleep and had a weird dream. She cut her eyes towards me. No, it, it wasn't a dream. I, I thought of that. It's the first thing I thought of, but I was awake. And I took a couple of steps back, thinking I just missed or, or, or overlooked the building the hall was a part of, though I didn't see how, but... She paused and her lip trembled. Jerry, what's wrong? Shaking her head again, she put on her blinker and turned into the rideshare parking lot. I hadn't realized how far we'd gone. I told you, you need to see it. It took us close to an hour to reach the boggy area she described, and most of that time we walked in silence. Jericho made it clear after my first couple of tries that she didn't want to talk about it until we were there, and I had a chance to see if I saw the same thing she had. It worried me. She still seemed amped up and happy, but I could see some fear there now, too. Maybe it was just recalling those memories, or maybe it was knowing that every step was taking us closer to whatever strange thing she had found in the woods. Either way, when we reached a certain point, she stopped, telling me to keep going forward, watching my footing, but also keeping an eye out toward my right. I wanted to argue, but held back. I didn't think this was some weird joke she was playing. She was serious about Whatever this was, believed in it at least enough to want me to see it too or verify that someone else saw it. So instead of arguing or asking more questions, I just nodded and kept moving forward. It only took a couple of dozen steps before I saw it. One moment I was looking out over a gray-green patch of mud and moss. The next, I'm looking down an enormous hallway of black wood floors and gray marble walls that seem to stretch on forever. Sucking in a breath, I stopped in my tracks. I... I see it. I took a few steps back and let out a gasp as the hallway disappeared, and the different angle didn't give me any sign of a building or other structure that could explain how the hallway could exist. Where? Where's the building it's in? Jericho was beside me now, squeezing my hand. So you see it? Really? Feeling slightly dizzy, I took a few steps forward and nodded. Yeah. Fuck, how is that possible? I can only see it at a certain angle. Pressing closer to me, she whispered in my ear. I think so, yeah. Describe it to me. I just want to make sure... I just want to make sure you see it the same way I do. The unspoken implication wasn't lost on me. She wanted to make sure I wasn't lying and just humoring her. It hurt my feelings slightly that she thought I'd do that, but... I pushed that aside. This was too important. Um, it's like really big, with black floors and gray walls that look like they're maybe stone or marble or something. She was quiet for a moment and then, it looks different for me. The floor's red, the walls are a deep dark blue. I don't see any lights in there, but I can still see. I nodded distantly. Uh, yeah, it's the same thing for me, too. Shaking myself out of my stupor, I took a few steps farther away from the hall, pulling her with me. This thing, it's like an optical illusion? Somehow swamp gas is reflecting something from somewhere else? Jericho shook her head. No. It's real. I took a couple of steps in last time before I chickened out. I could feel the walls and everything. I gasped at her. You what? This thing, it, it has to be dangerous. What could cause this? Shrugging, she looked past me at the hall. I don't know. And 
Just because it's mysterious doesn't mean it's dangerous. Meeting my eyes again, she smiled slightly. And you don't have to go in if you don't want. Just keep a lookout. And if I don't come back out in a few minutes, go get help. I just stared at her. Help? <laughs> what kind of help? Hey, can you come help get my girlfriend out of this magic hallway she's stuck in? I think it's over in this swampy area, but it's invisible unless you're just at the right. She put two fingers over my lips. First, you just called me your girlfriend. Jericho grinned at me. Secondly, I see your point. I think... I think this place gets to you. I've been having a hard time not coming back here ever since I left. I made myself wait so I could show it to you, but just barely. Maybe I'm not thinking straight. Hard hammering, I turned to look back down the hall. I just... I mean, maybe it really is some kind of trick. Not swamp gas, I don't mean that. But maybe someone made it where it looks invisible from the sign, but it's really not. Her smile faded as she shook her head. No, I tried that. If you walk through the area where the hall should be from the side, you don't hit anything. It's just... Empty air from every angle except the one where you can see it. I puffed out of breath to try to keep my voice steady. <sighs> Jerry, this is really uh, amazing, but it's also not right. And we don't know where it goes or what... I trailed off the words stuck in my throat. Or what could be in there. Her voice was low and hollow, as though any light or life had been dug out of its core. Giving her arm a squeeze, I nodded. Yeah, I mean, I'm not trying to be a pussy or anything, but we can't go in there, right? Sighing, she patted my hand. You're right. Of course, you're right. I don't know what we do with it, but we can't just go in. We shouldn't. She turned back the way we had come. Thanks for stopping me. We better head back before it gets too late. I felt a flood of relief as I turned to follow her and catching up. I took her hand. It's still really cool, though. We just, we just need to decide if we tell someone or come back and take a video or something or what. I just think we need to take it slow and be... Jericho had snatched free from me and was running back. As I turned to go after her, she suddenly juked to the right and vanished into thin air. Screaming for her, I ran up to where I could see the hallway again, and to my relief and horror, I saw Jericho there. She was trotting down the hall, looking at the walls as she passed. She was twenty feet in, then twenty-five, thirty... I stared on in mute terror for a few more seconds, as though I was afraid any slight sound may wake the strange world slumbering around her. Finally, my panic and desperation overcame that fear, and I began to scream her name again. She paused then, looking back at me with a smile. Just stay there! I'm just going to look for a minute, and then I'll be... She was too far away for me to see her face clearly, but I could still see her body suddenly tense as she looked around. I... I think I heard something? A, a, a bell, maybe? Come back! Hurry up and come back! Jericho nodded and began running back much faster than she'd gone down the hallway, but it seemed like she was making very little progress. I could also tell she was still hearing things that I couldn't hear, and when she turned and looked out behind her, she let out a terrible scream. Oh god, oh fuck, help me! I looked behind her, but I didn't see anything. Maybe she was just scared and there was nothing behind her? I stepped closer to the threshold of the hall, feeling the crackling pressure of some force or membrane in front of me, reaching the breaking point as I neared the edge of crossing over. I stepped closer to the threshold of the hall, feeling the cracking pressure of some force or membrane in front of me reaching the breaking point as I neared the edge of crossing over. It was then two things occurred to me. The first was the strangeness of Jericho running inside like that in the first place. She liked excitement, but she wasn't reckless or stupid. 
but hadn't she said the place had a hold on her? That even taking a couple of steps in and feeling the walls had been enough that she had to fight from going back here before I got home. What if that happened to me? And the hall. She said the hall looked different to her. Red floor instead of black. What if she was seeing and hearing whatever was chasing her was in her version of the hall? If I went in, could they get me too? Even if I couldn't see them? I pulled my hand back and took a few steps away from the hall. She was over halfway back now, though. I still didn't understand how it was taking so long. I had to just stay out of there, out of the way. I'd get her away from the hall once she was through, and in time she'd be okay again. That's when the first of them hit her, knocking her from her feet and sending her skidding back the way she had come. She let out a gasping wail, begging to help her as she started getting drugged backward by unseen hands. Again, I almost ran forward into the hall, but again, I stopped myself short of its edge. I, I, I'll get you help. Help me, help me now. Oh God, you're so cold. Her voice was high and wavering as she called to me, and when I answered again, I was little more than a tearful whisper. I, I'm so sorry. I can't. I made myself watch as she was drug away into whatever lay beyond the edge of my sight. Her screams lasted longer, but there came a time when I realized I was just imagining the ghosts of those sounds now. Trembling, I sat down and waited for an hour, but there was no sign of her or anything else. I would have waited longer, but... The idea of being near that hallway after dark was more than even my crushing guilt could bear. So I left. I went back to town, reported her missing, said we'd gotten separated during our walk, which was true enough in its own way. I didn't mention the hallway. I didn't see the point. But I did take them to the general area where I lost her. Ten men and women and two dogs searched that area for hours, but they didn't find anything at all. I think I halfway hoped someone would see the hall, or even better that everyone would, but no. No one ever saw anything out of the ordinary, and I made a point of staying far enough away I never caught another glimpse either. I thought I might have killed her, of course, especially when they talked to her doctor and found out she was eight weeks pregnant. One of the investigators flat out called me a murderer, said I dumped her in the swamp after I found out she was having my kid. I got locked up a couple of days for punching him, but after that they let me go. I moved away as soon as school let out, and in the ten years since I've never been back home, or even in that part of the country. I miss a lot of things about my life there, but the thing I miss the most is the one I've tried to forget. The last few weeks I haven't slept very well, waking up too early. At first, I just tossed and turned until giving up and getting out of bed, but the past several days I've been going out for walks. Just wandering. I was walking past the old high school near my house when I heard a bell behind me. My first thought was that it was a school bell, but that couldn't be right. For one thing, it was barely past sunrise. For another, this ringing came from behind me, and it was very close. Turning around, I saw the hallway stretched out behind me. Tingling, tingling. The hall was darker than I remembered, the air thick with something that wasn't quite shadow or smoke, but an oily cousin of each. I was breathless and transfixed, my chest aching as my heart pounded and my lungs began to scream for air. I sucked in a gasping breath when something stirred in the murk of the hallway. I let out a 
small cry, and then I ran away. It didn't matter. I can't run away from my past anymore, and I can't run away from the hallway for much longer either. It follows me, you see. At first, I would only see it at a distance from certain angles. After a few days, it started appearing behind me when I turned around. No one else can see it. And the more persistent it becomes, the harder it is to avoid stepping into it accidentally. But that's not why it'll get me, I don't think. It doesn't have its hooks in my brain the way it did Jerry. I never went inside, after all. But I still managed to bury a barb deep in my heart. Not when I didn't help my first girlfriend, or even when I left my old life behind for good. It was when I realized I do love Jericho, despite time and everything I did and didn't do. It was when I saw who was stepping out of the mists, ringing the bell solemnly, perhaps in greeting or warning, or both. It was a woman, and just behind her, a small boy. I've been keeping a low profile, but I was prompted to write this because I've seen in the news that a certain billionaire just bought a chunk of land in Arizona to build a smart city. He's not the only one with that idea. And I have to warn people. I only barely survived the prototype. The protesters for the new smart city were bright and cheery. They promised a community designed from the ground up with every need handled and every desire satisfied. I wouldn't have to worry about a thing if I lived there. Or so went the promise. I didn't move immediately, of course. It was only as my rundown neighborhood turned increasingly toxic and scary that I thought I'd give it a shot. So one chilly February morning, I packed up my meager belongings and set off for Gilmanton. After two nights spent sleeping in my car at rest stops, I saw the signs and I headed off the main highway for another few hours. Finally, there it was. The city was just a prototype, and therefore not as big as Chicago or Seattle or anything like that. The high, silvery walls formed a circle whose edges just barely touched each side of a shallowy, scrubby valley. People were parking pretty much anywhere, since the protesters had promised we wouldn't need our cars anymore. But we still managed to create orderly rows by working together and being sensible about it. It felt like I was arriving near the opening hour of a massive theme park, and the gobs of people walking all around me were friendly and excited. We didn't even get annoyed while waiting in line for hours. It was slightly cold out, but the sun was up, and we talked endlessly about how bad it was everywhere else and how good we were going to make it inside. When I got to the automatic paperwork dispenser at the front of the line, I didn't waste everyone's time like the people before me. I signed my papers immediately, stood in place for my picture, and headed on in. Those behind me cheered, and the speed of the line picked up as they began to do the same. About one in ten of those before us had chosen to turn and leave with a disturbed look on their faces, but that intermittent defection stopped once we skipped reading the waivers. An enclosed technology system was the last stop, and here the system dispensed a bracelet. I marveled at the design. It was my key, my, my passport, my phone, and my computer all in one. We didn't need any other devices. Everyone had divulged all their old technology, but it happened I forgot that my phone was in my inner jacket pocket. The battery had died on the way down, too, so the scanner at the gate didn't raise an alarm when I went through. The first main streets opened up before me as I stepped out under the February sun and into Gilmanton proper. The first official human being was there to greet each of us. 
he looked quite dapper in his fancy suit, and it turned out he was the mysterious billionaire that had built all of this. He shook my hand vigorously. Just call me Mr. Mudget. Nice to meet you, I said in awe. Where do we live in here? Pick any open residential apartment you like, he said graciously. First come, first serve, at least in this phase of the trial. That was great. I looked at a map on the city of my bracelet and looked for the highest apartment with the best view I could find. The ones next to it were already popping up as taken, so I ran over there and dashed up the stairs and tapped my bracelet to the wall computer just before another man. He griped a bit, but finally ran off to find another place for himself. Then, I sat in my new chair. The white-walled apartment was a bit more cramped than I'd expected, but it did contain a bed, a couch, a small kitchen area, in addition to the chair that faced the big glass window. Looking out, I could see down my street, and I was almost parallel with the top of the outer wall of the city. I'd expected more of a view, perhaps a lake or perhaps some of the terrain outside the walls, but it was fine. What more could I ask for in a free apartment? One of the walls did contain a television. The panel opened at the command of my bracelets, and I remained in my chair, changing the channels for a few minutes before I finally found a station. It appeared that there was only one station so far, which was fine. It was opening day, after all. The sole channel was Gilmanton News 1, and a well-dressed man and woman at a desk were reporting favorable stats of how well the first day of the city was going. After a few minutes, it occurred to me that the television was pretty loud and set right in the wall. Leaving it on, I went out to the dim brown walled hallway and knocked on my neighbor's door. It wasn't a typical door. It seemed to be made of metal with a wood layer over top to make it appear normal. All the doors were like that. It slid open to the left and an attractive woman answered. I immediately stopped slouching and remembered to be polite, but Melanie hadn't noticed the noise from the television at all. See? She said, wrapping her knuckles on the wall. Soundproof. Isn't that great? It was. I returned to my room and thought about how awesome it was that I wouldn't be hounded by the noises of my neighbors like I had been back home. That night, I slept better than I had in years. And the next day, I took a ride on the city's municipal rail. I could get anywhere in the city for free and without creating any pollution. The rooftops were all solar panels and supposedly there were wind turbines outside the wall somewhere. Mr. Mudgett had really done it. He'd built a self-sustained city full of good and decent people. I didn't much like my assigned job, but I couldn't complain. I'd put up with worse. No, my dissatisfaction began elsewhere. About five days in, I'd gotten used to my new surroundings and I was feeling brave. That night, I left my door slightly open. When I heard Melanie return to her apartment, I gave it about ten minutes, then went over and knocked. I had a whole excuse prepared about how I didn't know how to cook, but I did have this bottle of red wine I'd bought from the commissary on the first floor of our building. But she didn't answer. Were the doors soundproof too? I ring her doorbell. I waited for a good long minute before reaching up to ring it again. This time the door opened at the approach of my bracelet. Uh, I said loudly, directing my voice forward into the apartment. Your door just opened. No response followed. Awkwardly, I leaned in a little bit and looked this way and that. The bathroom was dark and empty, and the kitchen and living room area were pristine. Hello? I stepped fully inside. Melanie wasn't there. I checked my bracelet, which listed the apartment as unoccupied. But how was that possible? 
I'd literally heard her return home not 15 minutes prior. Now, not only was she not present, the system said her apartment wasn't owned at all. How had she even gotten out? I checked behind the couch, under the bed. There were no possessions, but that wasn't unusual since we'd all left everything behind when we'd arrived. The only strange detail I noticed was what looked like a bit of broken tile on the wall in the shower and the slightest trace of blood below as if someone had slipped and hit their head. There was nothing I could do but return to my apartment. Gilmanton News was still the only channel, and it was on televisions on every street corner, in every shop, at the gym, and even in the bathroom. Two talking heads were busy debating which aspects of Gilmanton were great, or the greatest. I left it on but didn't really pay attention until I wondered if I could get on that news program to ask about Melanie. Would that be weird? I let the idea simmer for a day or two. When I still hadn't seen her in that time, I decided to try and find the news studio. It wasn't listed on the map, but I wandered through the crowded city streets in search of an antenna powerful enough to send the signal. There was one toward the back of the industrial area, and... I left the crowds behind to creep through the narrow maze-like alleys. The walls here were just plain brick with no decoration, and I found myself feeling a little claustrophobic. In one dead-end passage, I saw a pile of old tools and crowbars. By the time I found the base of the antenna structure, I was more than ready to leave. Especially because there was no new studio at all. Through a window... All I saw were big stacks of computers. That night, sitting in the dark in my apartment, I watched the news anchors and talking heads on Gilmanton News 1. I mean, I really watched them. After two or three hours, I began to see the same patterns in how they moved their heads or talked, and it was especially obvious after six hours. The people on the news were computer-generated. They were just facades reciting programmed talking points. That chilled me to my core. But it was a smart city, after all. Didn't it save money to not have a studio or staff when computer-generated reporters worked just as well? Still, I was left unsettled. The news was our only source of outside information, and according to them, the rest of the country was falling apart. Crime and illness were everywhere, spearheaded by corrupt politicians that were basically monsters. Meanwhile, Gilmanton was a shiny example of perfection. We were safe from our fellow citizens outside, we were far more productive, and we had zero crime. I sent a few emails to old friends to confirm if that was the truth, but the system returned my messages with an error saying that those emails no longer existed. Maybe they'd changed. I wasn't sure. I tried to make some phone calls on my bracelet, but the system told me those numbers were no longer in service. We had the internet too, but it only seemed to be able to access local Gilmanton websites. Commercials all over these sites were full of citizens declaring how awesome the city was, and I scanned these until one caught my eye. It was Melanie. That was definitely her tiny picture next to her comment and had been posted the day before. Did that mean she was alright and just moved to a different apartment? I wondered if I'd put her off somehow and she'd move to get away from me. My concerns finally took me to Mr. Mudgett himself, the only actual person I could find that was in charge of anything, and he allowed me into his office with a warm smile. Of course, I'll look up your friend. He tapped away at his desktop computer, the only one I'd seen anywhere in Gilmanton, and he nodded. Says here she didn't feel like this was a good fit. She left the city to return to her old life. I shrugged. <laughs> oh, figures. Last week... Mudgett continued. Yep, nothing to worry about. She's back home. My blood ran cold. I kept my face neutral. Thanks for the info. Of course. How could she have left last week if she'd just 
commented earlier that day about how great the city was. I memorized her comment and began looking. There it was. On another forum, another user had used the exact same phrasing, including the same typo. Oh my god, it was... It was fake. The news, the comments, everything I'd perceived as my community, it was all fake. As I lay huddled under my blankets in bed, I realized I didn't really know anyone here at all. I'd wandered the Laventine streets, I'd seen crowds, but I didn't really have any friends. All the people I'd talked to and conversated with had been online. And I went through all my old conversations one by one until I found the same replies elsewhere. I'd literally been talking to programs, not people. And where the hell was Melody? I returned to her apartment, but it was owned. An extremely overweight man answered the door and seemed annoyed. I pushed past him and headed to the bathroom. Did you clean up the blood that was in here? He stopped complaining and said with concern. Uh, yeah? Why? I poked around in the shower until I noticed something odd. The bottom seemed to have a very thin black line. What's this? It started leaking after a couple days, he told me. Who knows why? I let that one pass to avoid hurting his feelings. His weight had broken something loose at the bottom of the shower. It seemed to move slightly when I pushed on it. I'll be back, I told him, and I left immediately for the industrial area of the city where I'd once seen discarded tools. They were the only useful objects I could think of. There existed no mechanisms elsewhere for the citizens to actually do anything useful. My neighbor was waiting for me with his door open when I returned with a crowbar. He too wanted to know what the hell was wrong with the shower. Together, we angled our might and the bottom of the shower fell away into darkness. It was a trap door. He stared at me in confusion. What is this? I could only shake my head. A sliding tube went down into darkness, slickened by the water of the shower itself. I think my previous neighbor fell here. Should I avoid taking showers then? Yes, I frowned. This is real. This is... dangerous. Ah, he only sort of seemed to grasp that something was wrong. Gunwood's in so great. This must be a fluke. I'll call maintenance. I nodded in supposed agreement with him and made an excuse to leave. How oblivious could he be? They'd built a goddamn slide under Melanie's shower. The intent couldn't be anything else. The kind of thing wasn't an accident. In tracking the possible trajectory of that slide, and went down to the basement of my building and found more twisted and confusing tunnels lined with gray brick. These were not on my bracelet map. Before I knew it, I began making marks on the gray brick like I should have done from the start, and slowly began to understand the lay of the area. When I came to the thick metal door, I was reasonably sure it held the destination of the slide, and I forced it open with about twenty minutes of angry prying. What I saw in there will haunt me for the rest of my life. There was not just one slide. The ends of at least a dozen tubes jutted from the walls, some of them still spilling shower water. They were all pointed at various cages, which contained women that had fallen into them like ragdolls. One of the cages held a sullen and bloodied man. The tables between the cages held bodies in various stages of dissection, and there was a vat of acid in which a still-living man was vainly trying to climb out along the smooth metal walls. The worst part? The underground menagerie of tortures was decorated like a ritzy office from the late 19th century. There were luxurious shelves containing old books, a fancy chair carved with century-old motifs, and a desk with, among other things, a quill and ink jar. There was not a dusty torture chamber, 
nor a place of grim business. Someone very much enjoyed this room. A whisper originated from a back cage, and I saw Melanie's gaunt face. She waved me over, and I skirted the acid vat and the one grasping woman from a table who was still alive despite her open chest cavity. Approaching the bars, I looked for the mechanism and began prying with my crowbar. She was free in moments, and she left behind the pile of people without a second glance. They had cushioned her fall and even given her some clothes, but none now lived. I was no hero. I didn't stay to free everyone else, nor did I try to ambush and fight whoever it was that had designed this nightmare factory of a city. Melanie and I ran through the confusing basement hallways for nearly an hour before finding the stairs up by pure luck. Mr. Mudgett was there in the lobby of our building, waiting for us with a grin. We ran past him and he made no move to stop us. You're killing people! We screamed at the few people walking by in the chill night air. There are trap doors under the showers and they're torturing and killing people in the basements. All we got were annoyed looks. One older man said, That would never happen in Gilmanton. Melanie screamed in his face and held up her bruised arms. What does this look like to you? You're just not worthy of living here. You've obviously made some bad choices, the man replied before moving on. It was then that we realized that nobody would hear us. Not only did they live in soundproof little cells, their minds were encased in similar prisons. Gilmanton News 1 was their only source of information, and every single day they were surrounded by automated comments and discussions reinforcing the idea that everything was alright and Gilmanton was perfect. Even if we got through to someone, the community at large would never listen to us. We ran a long and exhausting circle around the edge of the city that took until dawn, but there was no way out. We'd felt safe behind them for how well they'd kept out vagabonds, drifters, and other fears, but those walls kept us inside just as efficiently. As the sun crested the top of the buildings... Mr. Mudgett walked slowly up to us with that same grin. Finding a second wind, we ran again. We hid in a convoluted nest of alleys. Mr. Mudgett rounded a corner near noon, still grinning. Exhausted to the point of near collapse, we ran and hid in a highly populated shop. Mr. Mudgett entered to an array of applause from our fellow citizens. Thank you, thank you. Now, please go about your business. I'm a humble man. The others began to filter out at his unspoken request for privacy. Melanie screamed at them that he was going to kill us, that he was killing people even then, but they just spit on her and called her a crazy whore. When I insisted that she was telling the truth, they sneered and asked, what about those politicians outside these walls? They're far worse. Explain that before you try to recriminate the great Mr. Mudgett here. I stared at them in confused horror, but they left and the door to the shop swung shut after them. Mudgett watched us with that same eager grin. How do you always know where to find us? I demanded. <laughs> You're literally wearing a tracking device that tells me every single thing you say and do. I looked down at my bracelet. It had been required for every aspect of life. Even if I'd taken it off, I couldn't have opened doors, bought food, or taken the rail system. Somehow I really hadn't had a choice. He walked a slow, humored circle around us. Hmm. Shall it be the acid pit for you? Or perhaps asphyxiation? His eagerness grew as he spiraled closer. Maybe I'll see how many limbs and organs I can remove while still keeping you alive. I haven't tried that one in at least a hundred years. It really takes someone special to make that much effort worth it. Melanie clutched my arm while asking. A hundred years? He can't be that old. His laugh was filled with pity. <laughs> you poor thing. 
I've been building my murder castles for a very long time. The phrase sparked something in my memory, but it wasn't possible. You can't be him. You, you, you can't be H.H. H. Holmes. They hung him for his crimes a hundred years ago. A simple bribe to the right people and they executed the wrong man, he said with a widening smirk. A trick I've used a dozen times while further delving into the secrets of extended life. I looked to the shop owner in the corner, the only one who had not left, but he just cowered and pretended not to notice us. There would be no help here. I raised my crowbar, but Mudgett's eyes lit up. Oh, don't try that. I so do love the sensation. You might even cause my organs to cease functioning for a few minutes. He leaned in close and breathed on my face. It's like a little... vacation from being alive. I'd welcome it. I stepped back, desperate for any option. In that motion, I felt my old cell phone in my jacket's inner pocket. With my free hand, I retrieved it, pretended to tap a few buttons, and held it up to my ear. I'll call the police. At that, his sadistic grin finally faded. That would be very annoying. I've only just now shut up shop. Let us go, I told him loudly. Just me and Melanie. We'll just go, and I'll never trouble you again. He shook his head. I can't allow that. You'll sing like canneries the moment you're free. He sighed. <sighs> the girl stays here. No! Melanie shouted at him. And will not be harmed, Mudgett continued with an annoyed tone. Your leverage is your knowledge, so I will not harm her. My leverage is her well-being, so you will not tell anyone what you've seen here. Fair deal? Melanie pleaded with her eyes, but I didn't see any other way out. I don't know if that made me a coward, an asshole, or both, but I had to take the deal. I apologized silently and turned away from her. Mudgett walked me to the front gate himself and let me go. He never even suspected that my phone was out of battery. I was forced to walk for miles to find civilization again, since he'd kept my belongings and keys. Not that it mattered. The cars outside had been cleared away, likely sold for scrap. As far as the world was concerned, Gilmanton didn't exist, and even if it did, nobody specific had ever moved there. I could still hear Melanie shouting for me over the walls, and I began my long walk home. That's why I've spent the last few years keeping a low profile, not telling anyone about the horror movie that is Gilmanton, even as more smart cities are slated for being built. Thing is, I don't think I'm risking Melanie's life by talking. I kept in contact by email so I could be sure she was safe, but in the last few months, I've started to notice patterns in her responses. I looked up the name of my overweight neighbor back in Gilmanton, whose shower I'd broken open and found one of those relatives. They, too, were still receiving emails from him. The words were the same. The emails were fake. I didn't tell them that. I didn't tell them that he was dead, and I didn't tell anyone that Melanie had probably been chopped into pieces minutes after I departed. I'd been corresponding with a program and never known it. But now I have to speak out. It's not just that more smart cities are being built. I survived a smart city built on a small scale, but now I'm starting to see the bigger picture. Whenever we give away our self-determination, whenever we give away free thinking, we put our fates in the hands of others. Men of wealth and vast cruelty have been building murder castles for a very long time, just as Mudgett said. The walls are not always bright silver, nor so obvious. Mm.
This happened to me about two years ago while I was babysitting my best friend's kid. My friend had a pretty important meeting that morning and couldn't find a sitter that would be able to make it there in the time that she needed, so I offered. I made it to the house at 8am, got the little guy out of bed, made sure he brushed his teeth and then started getting his breakfast ready. It was Saturday, so there was no real rush to get him out of his pajamas even though his mom was a bit of a prude, I let him watch cartoons while I cooked. While I finished up the eggs, I heard him talking in the living room. That wasn't anything new. A lot of the shows he watched were in the vein of Dora the Explorer or Blue's Clues, shows that called for interaction from the kid watching. As I listened in, though, I noticed he wasn't responding to the bubbly personality on the screen. Rather, he was responding to... himself? Again, I didn't think too much of it as kids talk to themselves all the time, but when I went to get him for breakfast, he wasn't even watching TV. He was sitting in the corner just staring at the wall, talking up a storm. And he seemed annoyed. Parker, what's what's wrong, bud? Who are you talking to? He spun around startled. The tiredness in his eyes was all but gone now. No one? He said sheepishly. You're not in trouble, buddy. I tried to reassure him. I just thought there was someone else in the house, and I wanted to make sure you were safe. He just nodded and made his way back to the kitchen, whispering a small thank you as he went. I stood there for a moment, just staring at the corner as if something was going to come out of the wall and say, Sorry about that, that was me talking to the kid. Luckily, nothing did, and I went to sit at the table with Parker, hoping I could pull something out of him. How'd you sleep last night, Parker? Not too bad. He was only eight, but he spoke like a right gentleman. It was cute. I did have a bad dream, though. It's the one I've had before. I found myself holding my coffee just under my nose, not to take in the aroma, but because I felt like I needed to hide from him. I wasn't a parent, never really wanted to be one, so I tended to get defensive in situations like this. I didn't want to say the wrong thing and have Parker tell his mom I'm a terrible babysitter. I pushed for more details. Do you mind telling me about it? He pushed down an exaggerated sigh and explained. It starts with me waking up in my bed, but my room looks different. My floors are wood and my bed squeaks when I get up. I walk over to play with my toys, but they aren't there. They're old toys. They're all made of wood or metal and aren't very fun. After that, my bedroom door opens, but it isn't my bedroom door. The glow-in-the-dark stars are gone. It's just plain. It squeaks just like the bed does. I look at the doorway, and there's a big man standing there. He isn't fat, though. He's just really tall. Reminds me of a strong man from the circus. He never talks to me, but I get up and walk over to him. He takes my hand and walks me out of the bedroom. In the hallway, I see a reflection in the mirror, but I don't see me. I see another kid. Someone I don't know. I can't see the man's face. He's too tall. He takes me, or the kid, I guess, outside to his truck. He makes the kid get in the back of his truck and tells him to wrap him in a blanket. It's really cold and the blanket doesn't help. The ride lasts for a long time. When the truck stops, I hear the man get out and open the truck door on the back. I can't move now. Too cold. He carries me for a while before dropping me on the ground. I hear him start digging. And I wake up. I I wanted to cry. I felt so bad for this kid. That dream was way too vivid and way too dark for him to come up with on the spot. Not only that, but I think I knew what question I had to ask next. Do you think the person you've been talking to in the living room is the boy from your dreams? He nodded, then asked if he could go back out and watch cartoons. I told him that was fine and started cleaning up. I wasn't sure what to do at that point. I felt like I was 
living in a shitty horror movie. I shot a text to his mom letting her know that I wanted to talk to her about Parker and that it was nothing too serious, but it was really important. That night, Parker's mom and I spoke for about three hours about what we should do. We talked about therapy, mostly, but she was pretty nervous about that. Parker had trouble opening up to new people, and she wasn't even sure if she could afford it. We finally decided to just give him a few days and see if things got worse. She asked me to stay over for those days, just so she'd have someone else there with her in case things got worse. I agreed, and I'm glad I did. Monday night, two days after Parker told me about his nightmare, he woke up the whole house by screaming out from his room. His mom and I both ran in, her scooping him up and me sitting beside them for moral support. I didn't want to intrude too much until I saw it. There was a little boy in the corner of his room. A little boy who was a deep shade of blue with dark lips and dirt in his hair and mud on his shoes. Sarah, we need to leave. I barely spoke over a whisper, but she heard me and didn't argue. We grabbed a few changes of clothes, wrapped up Parker, and headed out for a hotel that night. Sarah and I spoke for a few more hours that night, and I explained what Parker had told me on Saturday and what I saw that night. After much deliberation, it was decided that they'd come stay with me and put that house up for sale. Neither of us were big believers in the paranormal, but there were far too many coincidences. Not only that, but my house was only about a 15-minute drive from Sarah's job, and Parker wouldn't have to change schools. As I said at the top, this was two years ago. Sarah and I are now engaged, and Parker has been doing much better. The house was eventually sold to an older gentleman and his wife, and I hope they have a better time in there than Parker and Sarah did. As I said in the title, I've been dealing with some weird shit lately, and I can't really think of anyone to go to other than the internet. My friends and family don't believe in this stuff, and I'm not to the point of hiring a stranger to come investigate my home. That's silly. I'm sure there's a logical explanation for everything here. I just need someone to actually see this post before it's taken down. This started two weeks ago, in my bedroom. A few times throughout the night, I'd wake up freezing. Turns out my blanket had fallen off the bed. I'll admit that I do roll over a lot when I sleep, but never so much to throw my blanket off of myself. This kept happening for about three nights, so I decided to film myself sleeping to see if my rolling around was really causing the blanket to fall from the bed. It wasn't. For the three nights that I filmed, somewhere around three in the morning, my blanket would simply slide off the bed. It was like someone was taking it off to wash it, but I never saw anyone. A few minutes after it hit the floor, I'd wake up freezing. Some people have asked for a more clear time frame, so I'll just say that this did start around November, so yes, it just could be cold in my house, but I keep the heat pretty much on all night. I shouldn't wake up freezing. A few more days passed, and more things began to happen. On nights that I didn't wake up freezing, I'd have terrible nightmares that left me groggy every morning before work. I decided I'd give coffee a try. I was never a big fan of it, but I figured with enough cream and sugar, anything can taste good. The first morning I made it, my cup moved behind my back. I know that sounds insane, and I think this is where I normally lose people, but hear me out. I would place the mug down beside the coffee pot, then turn around to grab the sugar and cream from the fridge. When I would turn back around, the mug wouldn't be on the counter with the coffee pot, but rather on the island in the middle of the kitchen. And for the sake of getting asked this 100 times, yes, I live alone. There was no one over to visit, and no one else in the house. I've been alone while all of this has been happening. That's why I'm so freaked out. The teleporting mug and the blankets being taken off me in the middle of the night have been fairly constant over these two weeks, but there's something new that I'm experiencing. Well, it's a little scarier than the other things. 
A few days ago, I woke with my back right shoulder blade feeling incredibly sore. My first thought was that I just slept on it wrong or pulled a muscle, but when I went to apply Icy Hot to it, I noticed it was raised. There was a welt on my back. I grabbed a mirror and ran to the bathroom to look at it. I wish I could show you all, but every time I try to upload it, something goes wrong or the photo gets corrupted. So I'll do my best to explain it. In the simplest terms, it's a hand, but a rather big one. It's bright red, like a sunburn, but not hot to the touch. Its middle finger barely crests over my shoulder, and the bottom of the palm is just slightly below my actual shoulder blade. In an attempt to stop any other questions, I'm expecting, yes, I've been to the doctor. Well, more specifically, the emergency room. I was too freaked out about it to book an appointment and wait. The doctor told me it was likely eczema or a similar skin rash, prescribed an ointment, and sent me on my way. When I asked him why it was shaped like a giant hand, he just laughed, told me I was seeing things. It's also worth noting that it's not itchy, either. I'm afraid that there's something going on in my house, and it's made even worse by the fact that no one believes me. If you read this post before it's likely taken down, and think you know what it is or how to stop it, please reach out to me. I'm scared. Since I was old enough to understand what ghosts were and old enough to watch Ghost Hunters, I told my parents I wanted to do that for a living. As an adult, I understand how ridiculous that dream was. I'm not even sure being a professional ghost hunter is a thing, but that didn't stop me from asking for a ghost hunting kit every year for my birthday until I was 16. That was the year my parents caved. They told me that I could have it as long as I was safe and didn't do anything stupid. Basically, don't break into any abandoned buildings or asylums looking for ghosts because I'll more than likely find a trespassing charge rather than the paranormal. I understood where they were coming from, so I looked up a few haunted locations in my area. A few were old bridges that were way too dangerous to cross, or places that were long abandoned and forgotten to time that were fenced off. It took a few hours, but I finally ran across something that was safe to visit, and wouldn't get me in trouble. At least I hoped. It was a cemetery, about a mile from my house. I won't share the location of the cemetery, because while the story takes place nearly 30 years ago, the cemetery is now a protected historical landmark, and I don't want this comment held against me if someone tries something stupid. I set out one night with a friend, assuring my parents we'd be safe and we wouldn't get into any trouble. The cemetery was creepy enough during the day, but at night, it was something completely different. Some of the headstones were falling over due to age, some were completely split. There were even some large tombs that had been erected some hundred years ago. We walked the perimeter, doing an EMF sweep, but nothing came up. We then decided to try out that digital voice recorder and see if we could speak to anyone. I suggested we do a blast session. It's a silly ghost hunting term that means we'd ask a question, wait about a minute or 30 seconds, and listen back to see if anything spoke back. It was a good way to communicate with whatever may be out there. For clarity, I'll format this next part like a conversation because there was definitely someone there. Austin started with a simple, Is anyone here with us tonight? We sat across from each other, legs crossed, and about a foot from the closest headstone, one that was incredibly weathered and on the verge of falling over. I stopped the recording and played it back. We heard Austin ask his question through the tiny crackly speaker and then listened harder for a response. Yes. It was faint, nearly a whisper, but we knew what it was the moment we heard it. We must have played it back five or six times before we tried again with the same tactic. 
This time I asked the question, how old were you when you died? It was a pretty brutal question in retrospect, but I was 16 and stupid. We ran the recording back and heard the same voice only seconds after mine say, 72. It was clearer this time, and it sounded closer. I knew what we had to do next. One thing the ghost hunting kit didn't come with was a night vision camera. I assumed that was because they're much more expensive than a recorder and a plastic box with some LEDs on it. Luckily, my parents thought about that and were able to get one for me. It was the cheapest possible one at the time and could only record about 10 frames a second, literally, but it worked. I held it as steadily as I could and pointed it to Austin while he held out the EMF detector and the voice recorder. Then, he started asking questions and running the recording back periodically. Everything was quiet for a while, and we thought maybe what we'd heard was nothing more than our imagination. That was until I saw something on my camera. Austin, don't move, I said. There was a large mass of pure black only inches from his back, and it was towering over him, which wasn't an easy feat. Austin was the center for our school basketball team at the time, mostly because he was 6'3", but the shadow was well over that. Maybe even a full seven feet. There were no features, no arms or legs. It was just a blob. I'm not sure how much time passed before Austin responded to my warning of not moving, but when he did, all he said was, I can't. Watching the jumpy video from the camera, I saw this black blob slowly moving its way over top Austin. I could tell he was terrified, and I knew something was wrong, but I did the only logical thing I could think of in that situation. I threw the camera in my bag, snatched Austin by the arm, and yanked him toward me while yelling, Run! I'm not sure either of us had ever run that fast in our lives. We hopped on our bikes and pedaled until the cemetery was out of sight. Once we felt we were far enough away, we collapsed into a ditch just long enough to catch our breath. While lying there, I noticed Austin's breathing seemed off, so I shined my flashlight on him to make sure he was okay, and for the most part he was, but he was also crying. Anyone who grew up around the time that I did knows what this would usually lead to. Boys around that time were teased for showing emotion, but I could tell that he was really shook from the experience. I just told him I was sorry and gave him a hug. Shortly after, he calmed down and we made it back to my house in one piece. My dreams of being a ghost hunter were pretty much smashed that night. I never tried it again and probably never will. I still talk to Austin on a regular basis, and this story is one that comes up every year around Halloween. No one ever believes us, of course, but that's fine. We know what happened that night, and that's all that matters. My son told me about this thread because he knew I had quite the story. I'm new to Reddit and don't type on the computer often, so excuse any mistakes in my writing. This happened well over 30 years ago. I was in my early 20s and into my first real home. A well-off friend of mine's father was willing to rent it out for free for a month under the promise that I'd get a job in that time and start paying. It wasn't a bad deal, so I took it and started working as a bag boy at a mom and pop shop down the road. The store was only a 10 minute walk, and since I didn't have the money saved for a car, it made perfect sense for me. One lane street with no white lines on the sides or even reflectors. Pretty dangerous at night if you weren't careful. I didn't figure that out till much later. I'd say about three months after moving into the house. The bag boy job was going well, but when my boss asked if I could work nights putting things on shelves for a pay raise, I took it in an instant. I'd always been a night owl, and having the whole day to myself sounded like a dream. Furthermore, I'd spoken with some of the night crew before, and they seemed like really good people. At this time, I still didn't have my car, so walking was my only choice. Sure, it was a short walk, but with my shift starting at midnight, it was pitch black when I went to work now. 
with all the trees on each side of the street, the moonlight barely peeked through. This was well before cell phones that have everything you need on them, including a flashlight, so I'd take my own actual flashlight to light the way. I wouldn't admit to anyone at the time, but I had started jogging down that road just to get off it faster. I always felt like there was something out there. A few weeks after starting the night job, I learned that there was something out there. It started like any other night. I walked to the house, my uniform on and flashlight ready. Just as I was out of the glow of my porch light, I turned it on and stopped. I just froze in the middle of the road. My flashlight caught something in its cone of light. I thought at first it was a man, granted one that needed a lot of help, much more than I could have offered, but as I looked on, I noticed it was far too lanky to be a person. I've known tall people all my life, but when someone walks on their hands and knees, their back end is always higher. Their legs are most likely longer than their arms. This wasn't the case with this thing. It was on all fours, but its back half was much lower to the ground, almost like a squat. It had large, bony hands placed down in front of it, fingers pointing out, and its elbows pointed inward. Thin, gray, and white hairs hung from its pockmarked and oily head. Its mouth was wide open and far too big for its face, and a thick black tongue hung from it, dripping with saliva. I think I heard it breathing letting out gasping, raspy breaths. I wish I could say that I stood my ground and fought it off into the woods and brought it back to mount over the fireplace, but in reality I did none of that. I ran back to my house, slammed the door, turned all the lights on, and called my boss to tell him I wasn't coming in unless he was willing to come get me. When he asked what was wrong, I thought about telling him what I'd seen, but decided it was best to go with the more logical explanation told him I'd seen a bobcat. Didn't feel too safe walking alone. He understood and came and got me. Work was a nice distraction for the rest of the night, but I still think about what the hell that thing was. To answer any questions before they're asked, no, I wasn't on anything, prescription or otherwise. Secondly, this happened in rural Georgia. I don't want to say too much about the location because I'm still fairly close to where it happened and Finally, no. I never saw it again, but I did hear something screaming out in the woods on a few occasions, and I know for certain it wasn't a bobcat. I've had a lot of people try to convince me that this was simply a case of sleep paralysis, but I've never believed it. There was definitely something else going on that night. I was about 15 or 16, and my parents had just moved us into a new house. It wasn't that old, maybe 20 or 30 years, but like a classic horror movie, the previous tenants had passed away in the house. My dad tried to convince my mom that it played no part in the house being sold well below market value, but we knew that's exactly what was happening. Either way, we were in a new house and were excited to get to know the new city, and I was ready to make some new friends since I had to switch schools. Everything was going wonderfully until about a month in. I started to have some pretty severe nightmares which turned into night terrors. Three or four times a week, I'd have the same dream. I'd see myself lying in my bed before it would change to a first person perspective of someone standing outside looking at our house. I would hear heavy breathing, almost wheezing, as if the person breathing was asthmatic. Through this POV, the person would make their way into our house via kicking open the front door and go straight to the room I was sleeping in. But I wasn't the one in the bed, and the house looked a lot different. It was older. The person in my bedroom was an older gentleman. He must have been quite a heavy sleeper as he didn't wake up until this other man placed his hands around his throat. My nightmare would end just as the old man's eyes would go completely bloodshot and his face turn a deep blue. I'd wake up, gasping for air, sweating profusely and screaming for my parents. This continued exactly like this for weeks. 
I was put into therapy and given sleeping medication, but nothing worked. It all came to a head the night after my 16th birthday. My parents tried to do something nice for me that day, but I was so perpetually tired that I could barely pay attention to anyone or anything. All I wished for that day was a decent night's sleep. Of course, that was too much to ask for. On our last night in that house, I fell asleep around 10 p.m. and awoke in the middle of the night, completely unable to move. I was lying on my back, moving my eyes around to look around the room, but my actual body couldn't move, not even my mouth. I would guess that only a few seconds passed before I heard our front door splinter and hit the wall behind it. I fought to move because I knew it was going to come, but I couldn't. I heard the heavy set man wheezing as he came down the hall into my room and stood over me for a moment before wrapping his giant hands around my neck. He squeezed, and I felt it. I swear I felt it. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't move. I was fighting against everything to lift a single finger for what felt like hours before finally I shot up in my bed, sucked in as much air as I could, and started looking around the room for the large man. But he wasn't there. Second, I tried to call for my mom, but my throat was so sore I couldn't speak above a whisper. I ran into their room and woke them up, trying to explain what happened. It took a few minutes, but when they saw the redness and bruises developing on my neck, they told me to stop talking and we rushed to the ER. No one believed me, as you would imagine, and... I was even put on watch for some time while my throat recovered. I was incredibly lucky that nothing fractured or was broken. I spoke with my parents over the few weeks I was in the hospital and despite everything, convinced them I wouldn't be staying in that house until something was done. We weren't religious, but after speaking with a priest, they suggested getting the house cleansed. Once that was over, I moved back in after staying with my aunt for a few days. The nightmares stopped sometime after that, and I never had another episode of sleep paralysis. I say that knowing full well that wasn't what it was in the first place, because as I found out later, the previous tenant didn't just die in that house. He was murdered by the husband of the woman he was sleeping with. She'd been killed as well a few hours before the man made it to my house. <laughs> 